Hi, everybody. Hi, Anita. Hi. I'll be in for dinner. Good afternoon, Council. May I have a mover and seconder to call the meeting to order? Councillors Thompson and Moore, that the special meeting of the Council of the Township of Springwater, January 18th, 2023, come to order at 1 p.m. All those in favor? And that is carried. Council, are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? And seeing none, at this point, I would call on Director Radigan to introduce today's session and call on SSEA to make their presentation. Thank you. Mayor Coughlin, Deputy Mayor Cabral, and members of council. This afternoon marks the beginning of the township's 2023 budget and business plan deliberations. This afternoon's meeting has been set aside specifically for our service partners, including the Springwater Public Library, the Severn Sound Environmental Association, the Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority, the Barry Physician Recruitment, as well as South Georgian Bay Physician Recruitment. Our service partners have been allocated time to present their 2023 budget requests for council to review and to further ask questions for further clarification. I'd like to provide a quick overview of uh, each service partner's request prior to commencing. The library is requesting an increase of approximately $60,444. That's a 0.36% overall increase to uh, the tax levy. NBCA is seeking an increase of $11,241. That's a 0.07% increase. SSEA is seeking an increase of $3,276, which is a 0.02% increase. The police services budget, which are um, they are not here uh, to present today. However, they have provided um, their budget and their increase is $21,558, which is a 0.13% increase to the budget. Now, the BIA, as well as the very physician recruitment and South Georgian Bay physician recruitment have not provided an increase for 2023, and hence there is no tax levy impact um, to their budget since there is no change. Thank you, and I will now turn it over to SSEA for their presentation. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, members of council, uh, deputy mayor, staff, and other guests. I'm just going to pull our presentation up and share. Can everybody see that all right and hear me okay? Um, so thank you again for the opportunity to review the services the SSEA provides to you and your ratepayers, as well as to answer questions today surrounding our budget request. I'm Julie Cayley, the Executive Director, and joining me today are Melissa Crothers, our Risk Management Official and Inspector, as well as Aisha Shondet, who's our Water Scientist uh, Limnologist. And we'll be providing a brief orientation around who we are, what we do for you, um, before we uh, go back into the budget. So Springwater is part of the Severn Sound watershed, um, watershed being an area that of the land that drains or seeps uh, to a common water feature. So that could be a marsh, stream, river, lake, or groundwater. In our case, that's Severn Sound that you can see up here, the open waters part of Georgian Bay. And this watershed approach is important. What happens on the land obviously impacts the rivers and the groundwater that drain to that area. Um, of Severn Sound, and we're all downstream or upstream of someone or something. And the Severn Sound watershed itself, so this whole area, um, including you, is approximately a thousand kilometers squared in size and is a transition zone between Precambrian shield and sedimentary rock. So pretty unique area, uh, sedimentary bedrock, I should say. And a mix of farmland, forest cover, rural and urban areas uh, consists of nine municipalities, um, primarily in the county of Simcoe with a small portion of our area in the district of Muskoka as well. And uh, obviously has a fluctuating population based on seasonal residents and visitors. We're also home to significant First Nations Métis community and national and provincial parks. 
Again, important to point out here that SSEA focuses our services only on the SSEA watershed, so the northern portion of Springwater Township, so the area that drains north towards Severn Sound. So when addressing environmental issues, it's obviously important, obviously in our world, important to consider watershed boundaries in addition to your municipal boundaries. Um, I know the NVCA is also going to be addressing you this afternoon and their watershed includes the part of Springwater, um, includes part of Springwater as well. And we do have an MOU in place between our organizations and your township so that we don't duplicate services between our two organizations in the severance on portion of the township. And if you see the black directional areas, arrows on the map, that's the headwaters of three of Severn Sound rivers, which are located within the township, including the Y, the Sturgeon, and the Hog Creek. So spring water is connected to your surrounding municipalities and to Severn Sound open waters through numerous headwater streams and rivers, which make you a unique and very important part of the Severn Sound watershed. A bit of background on us, in 1987, Severin Sound was listed as one of the 17 Great Lakes areas of concern, mainly because of degraded water quality and some habitat issues as well. But the main issue was nutrient loading from a variety of sources. And addressing this and other beneficial use impairments meant we had what was known as the Severin Sound Remedial Action Plan. So a precursor to the current SSEA organization. It was developed, implemented in cooperation with your municipalities, the federal and provincial governments, as well as community members, in particular, the agriculture community was very active in this uh, in the work that we did. And it was a huge success story. So all stakeholders working together in 2003, this area was delisted as one of the areas concerned. So currently one of only three delisted areas of concern in Canada, so three of the 17. So in uh, 1997, the SSEA organization was established and we've been your joint municipal service board under the Municipal Act of which you're a founding member of the association since 2009, providing environmental services to our eight municipal partners where you share the cost and the resources and services that the team of uh, experts that we have can provide. I wanna just take a moment to thank your past representative, Perry Ritchie for this, his time on the SSEA board as well. So sharing cost and services is really an efficient and effective way to invest in clean water, in natural heritage, natural infrastructure, as well as climate action, and really critical to our collective health and the health of our communities and our economy. Through the partnership, you have access to a team of highly qualified individuals, very diverse expertise amongst this team, and we look forward to working with you and your staff in 2003 and beyond. And we're very fortunate. Much of our team has a real significant longevity within, um, within the watershed, within the local area. So exceptional historical local knowledge. So as we start our uh, discussion into our services, I'd like to pass the presentation now on to my colleague, Melissa Carruthers. Melissa. Thanks, Julie. Uh, so SSCA, we're also a, a source protection authority as named in Ontario Regulation 28407 under the Clean Water Act, and we operate on a watershed basis with this under this program. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, at the SSCA, we do have a very positive working relationship with our neighboring source protection authorities. So in our region, those being the NVCA and LSRCA when it comes to the implementation of this program. As a source protection authority, the SSCA offers the following services, just to name a few. So we support staff, the Source Protection Committee and various implementing bodies to fulfill their roles in the Drinking Water Source Protection Program. Uh, and we work to ensure the local source protection plan and assessment reports are up to date. So mostly this comes into play with newer changing municipal drinking water systems. Uh, currently within the Township of Springwater, we're going through a process for the Castle Drive wells near Hillsdale. That's uh, a very long process. There's lots of steps and uh, SSEA acts more as like a project management role when it comes to the changes to the systems. Next slide, please. Within the Severn Sound watershed, our tree planting programs have been ongoing since the early 90s and includes facilitating large and small tree planting projects on public and private lands through our community tree planting program, as well as our tree seedling distribution programs, where we provide low cost seedlings to landowners who then plant the trees themselves. We've facilitated planting of more than 10,000 trees in spring water over the last 15 years, and this represents an important component of climate change mitigation. We are excited to have received funding from the federal 2 billion trees program to help us increase our tree plant capacity and are looking for input on how to plant more trees in the township, including any potential tree planting sites. In terms of land and water stewardship, 
we provide general information to the community and our municipal partners on wide ranging topics, for example, maintaining a natural shoreline or stream buffer. And SSEA staff also review and comment on general land use planning and policy with an environmental lens in terms of water quality, invasive species and habitat. Next slide, please. Some of the services we provide are funded at a cost recovery rate or supported by external funding sources. As you will likely hear in the NVCA presentation, most land use planning review is done under your agreement with the Conservation Authority. However, there has been site specific project requests, in particular where the development is where the development is in the Severn Sound watershed uh, and you're looking for water quality data and or background conditions. We can assist with review of site specific projects, plans or environmental impact studies at the request of the township with respect to natural heritage or water quality and there, these reviews can be done on a cost recovery basis. SSEA supports municipalities participating in habitat related initiatives such as Bee City Canada which focuses on pollinator habitat protection. We also plan and facilitate site-specific project and best management practices that protect and improve water quality and habitat. And these types of projects typically include sourcing and applying for external funds to support the project. Next slide, please. As SSEA partners, you have access to our very comprehensive invasive species program with a few of the key outcomes or services being the Severn Sound Invasive Species Strategy, which provides a long-term framework with strategic actions that help to maximize the benefits of a shared program. The Invasive Species Working Group, which is an opportunity to share knowledge and voice concerns among SSCA partners. Annual Invasive Species Reports specific to your municipality. Technical expertise to township staff on invasive species prevention, monitoring, and management strategies. Uh, we work to educate residents, community and school groups on invasive species issues and get residents involved in local initiatives such as removals and provide a centralized location for residents to report invasive species and address related questions and help municipalities to access money and resources for invasive species projects. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Asia for the next couple of slides. Thank you, Rosa. That's the next slide. Perfect. Um, so another key component of SSA's core services is the environmental monitoring that we do. Under the MOU, we fill the monitoring role in the Severn Sound portion of the township. So we have several programs that, that fall into this category. Water quality data has been collected in Orr Lake, uh, the Y River and feeder tributaries, as well as groundwater monitoring wells for many years and the ability to analyze trends and look for relationships between stressors and water quality indicators is really invaluable. For example, we've documented increases in nitrate and chloride levels across the watershed, including the Y River, and continue to observe exceedances in provincial water quality objectives for phosphorus in the Y River, although levels have decreased over time. With support from external grants, we've also developed citizen science programs to broaden our monitoring reach, and we've had two volunteers in the township uh, last season. Volunteers submit valuable data on water quality conditions, and there's a huge benefit in engaging residents and observing and protecting the places that they care about. Next slide, please. We continue to track temperature at uh, long-term monitoring sites on the headwaters of Y River, Hog Creek, and Sturgeon River uh, in order to detect changes that might impact fish and invertebrate populations. So more warm water sites can uh, be used to prioritize stream restoration work like tree planting, and cold or cool water sites can be prioritized for protection. Our ongoing climate monitoring program consists of a network of sites across the watershed, which are also relevant for Springwater Township. It is used to track trends and interpret findings from other monitoring work. So for example, looking at the influence of weather conditions on algae growth in or lake or stream temperature. Overall, our core monitoring programs give the township access to background data and support to make informed resource management and land use planning decisions. Additionally, Severn Sound was delisted, as Julie mentioned, under the condition that environmental quality monitoring continue to ensure that improvements that were made are not lost. Next slide. There are additional services we provide to the township that are above and beyond our core services, which are provided at our internal partner rate. The primary example here is the inland lake monitoring of Orr Lake. So we do comprehensive water quality surveys every five years, and this began in 2010. This allows us to track signs of nutrient enrichment and other stressors 
on the lake, such as runoff and de-icing salt usage. Results of this monitoring, which is uh, conducted every two weeks from May to October, uh, plus the annual through ice sampling that we do in the winter. These results are used to assess current conditions and trends in water quality from an ecosystem perspective and to make recommendations on actions needed to protect water quality. During monitoring visits, we also uh, inspect the shoreline and open waters for uh, potentially harmful algae blooms, so blue-green algae, uh, and acting as sort of the technical liaison with the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks on reporting anything that we see that could be an issue. Zebra mussel monitoring is also done through analysis of uh, zooplankton samples. So we're looking for the larvae, uh, as well as artificial substrates that we put out in the lake uh, to find adult mussels. So with this, we're trying to determine whether there's a self-sustaining population present. We have found mussels in the last couple of years and want to know, you know what the population is looking like, because uh, these can really cause major ecological changes in the lake, uh, such as making blue-green algae uh, blooms more, um, more common. Lake invertebrate sampling was also conducted uh, at locations as part of the 2021 or lake survey. Uh, so this is the second time we've done this sampling and we'll be able to compare results to uh, the previous survey. Other site-specific monitoring can be arranged on an as-needed basis, which can be done at a lower cost than hiring an outside consultant. And we have the added benefit of our staff having quite extensive uh, current and historical knowledge in the area. Next slide. So I won't go through uh, all the details shown here, but you can take a look at the field results from our uh, 2021 survey, which is on our website. And there will be a more fulsome conditions report on the 21, 2021 survey forthcoming, which is similar to the 2017 report that's on our website. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out, I encourage you to do so. Next slide. The map here uh, highlights locations of the current and past SSEA monitoring sites within the township. So included are locations for invertebrates, the stream temperature, provincial stream water quality monitoring network, um, stream and lake water quality, and groundwater quality and quantity, uh, which is done in partnership with uh, both the province and the Ontario Geological Survey. So we work to ensure that there's no duplication with um, MVCA's monitoring programs as we monitor sites only within our watershed. Next slide. We deliver uh, additional services, uh, so things such as commenting on provincial policy and supporting deputations, uh, things like AMO and the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, and really providing that united voice representing our eight municipal partners so we can sort of provide that watershed lens. Our education and outreach work takes many forms, such as through our well-developed presence on social media, presence in any municipally led events, and production of guides and fact sheets such as our quick ID sheet for algae blooms that we provide to, uh, to shoreline residents. We also have partnerships with a number of academic and government research institutions, which has allowed us to really increase our project capabilities and uh, access to additional expertise. Our staff are constantly looking to build and maintain new and existing partnerships to leverage our expertise and funding dollars and provide added benefits to our municipal members. Next slide. The Sustainable Severn Sound is an SSCA special project, which your municipality is, a, is newly a member of. Uh, and this supports municipalities with climate change action focused on greenhouse gas emission reductions. So Springwater joined uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Partners for Climate Protection or PCP program and started working towards achieving milestone one, which includes creating a greenhouse gas em uh, emissions inventory and forecast. So this work will reveal how the township consumes energy and generates waste and will provide the baseline data against which we can measure progress. We also represent our municipal partners as members of uh, the Health Units Climate Change Exchange Network. And we understand the township is exploring the process of becoming a BCINI member. So our staff can assist with implementation of municipal BCD action plans, uh, providing general information and guidance, uh, various support and advice, uh, as well as accessing grants to undertake uh, things like pollinator garden projects. Next slide. So just to hit some of the, the key highlights of uh, a program work that we did in 2022, 
So as Melissa mentioned, uh, the Castle Drive well project um, under the source protection uh, authority work that she does. Water quality um, work included monitoring at our winter site on our lake, which we'll be uh, looking to do again this winter. Hopefully the ice conditions stay safe enough. It's been quite warm out there. Um, we've completed our, our monitoring of groundwater wells uh, and the water quality at uh, a nearby uh, provincial groundwater site. So this is just beyond the township border, but it's, it's quite close and we sort of consider that uh, to be a benefit to the township. Um, looked at stream invertebrates uh, from the Sturgeon River this year uh, and also our long-term stream temperature sites. Climate monitoring has continued at our, our two weather stations in the area, as well as uh, rain gauge sites. And on our website, you'll find a summary of the 22, uh, 2022 results, including crop heat units, which is a particularly valuable um, piece for our farm community. Citizen science data collection for this uh, for the 2022 season is complete, and we'll be reporting on that information over the coming months. Next slide. Under our invasive species program, every year we hold regular meetings of our IS working group, and we thank the township staff who have participated in that. Uh, through invasive species work, we also did uh, targeted invasive mussel surveillance on Orr Lake, uh, so in 2022, and this builds on uh, the initial work that we started in 2021. To date, as the associate member working on your behalf in the PCP program, SSEA staff have acquired data through publicly available documents to get started on uh, the GHG inventory work. So this includes building and facilities, street lights, uh, water and wastewater, and solid waste. Something we're very excited about, uh, we've recently published a pollinator guidebook. So hard copies will be distributed to municipal offices, and it's also currently available uh, in digital form on our website. Our tree distribution programs were mentioned earlier. Um, spring water residents in the Severn Sound watershed portion continue to participate in our plant your own uh, tree distribution programs. And we thank the township uh, staff for assistance in promoting and uh, supporting implementation of this initiative. And with that, I will pass it back to Julie. Thank you, Aisha. So a major work plan items heading into uh, 2023 or in, I guess we're in it. Um, we're moving forward with you, including things like acting, continuing to act as your source protection authority for the Severance on Watershed. Uh, the continuation of long-term monitoring and reporting, the things that Asia um, and Melissa have both just covered, uh, reporting on our past data, as well as this, uh, we're heading into our 20th anniversary year. So some extra reporting uh, and data analysis for that. Um, I should mention too, um, Aisha did not mention, but um, she's always looking for new citizen science volunteers. So if anybody watching or listening or anyone in the room or around the, the council table would like to volunteer, we're happy to have you join us. Um, the continuation of site-specific plan and development review on, on your request as needed, um, including any stormwater monitoring guidance for the SSEA portion of spring water, which we'd of course be coordinating with the Nottawasaga Valley as well. Stewardship projects, we're certainly excited about the tree planting and the, uh, the new uh, program expansion money um, that we've received from the federal government. The tree distribution program, the order deadline did just pass on Friday, but we do maintain a waiting list. And Michelle wanted me to make sure we said if uh, if anybody missed out or uh, wants to be on the email list for future notifications, if you're in the Severn Sound watershed, to please let us know. Um, and uh, there's always a waiting list, so it's worth getting on if uh, if you think you might want some seedlings and you've missed out. Um, obviously, continuing our invasive species program the monitoring management, um, working with your staff on what your municipal needs might be around that program area, um, and taking you into year two of the Sustainable Severance Sound Project. So finalizing the corporate and community GHG or, uh, inventory and submitting your milestone one documents. And then of course, working towards milestone two and three, including the creation of your climate action plan. Um, updating details about uh, spring water, both on the uh, Sustainable Severin Sound and uh, SSEA website. So those two are connected um, regarding the PCP tool. So there's a public facing profile uh, so folks can see the progress you're making, as well as uh, supporting spring water in your pollinator uh, projects as you move those forward. 
And so I also want to mention, thank you for including us in your strategic planning sessions. Those have been really fascinating, and um, I really appreciated uh, having SSEA engaged in those. We'll be launching our own refresh of our strategic plan this coming year and look forward to engaging you in ours as well. Uh, and we're also going to be doing a review of our rate and fee structure. It's been quite some time since we've done that, so we will be doing a review. You do have our budget request in front of you. So the core uh, for the Township of Springwater is um, the 85,000 approximately. There is no cost on the tree distribution. Um, we do uh, appreciate any in-kind time that we do get from our municipalities. So thank you to your staff for, uh, for helping us out, whether it's with distribution or with storage or with moving trees to different uh, pickup locations. The SSS or Sustainable Severance Sound Project will continue um, at the same cost as last year. That's the 11,479. So I wanna thank you again for your time today. We really look forward to working with you and to your new representative to our board, Council Alexander. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you um, in an upcoming orientation and our first board meeting. So um, your worship, we're happy to take questions. Thank you, Juliet. At this time, we'll just get the motion on the table and then we'll move to questions. So may I have a mover and seconder to receive the presentation from the Severn Sound Environmental Association, Deputy Cabral and Councillor Garwood, that the presentation from the Severn Sound Environmental Association regarding the 2023 budget request be received and that the SSEA operating budget request in the amount of 96,770 representing spring water share be referred to the January 20th, 2023 budget session for further consideration. Councillor, are there any questions or comments at this time? Deputy Cabral. Thank you, Mayor Coughlin. Um, actually, thank you for the presentation. Very informative, as always. It's nice to be able to see the things and projects that are going on <clears throat> that we are benefiting from, along with other uh, municipalities. But sitting here, um, listening to uh, what your, your real responsibility is, which is uh, water protection, I can't help but think to ask the question with respect to Dr. Bill Shoddick, uh, the Elmville Water Festival, uh, the kiosk, and the Waverly Uplands, whether or not uh, um, you folks have any involvement with them, whether you're providing any support to that group, or, or whether, in fact, uh, you have knowledge or involvement with them. So I, I'd be very interested in knowing because it, it he's been testing the water on 27 there, just north of Floss Road 10 on the family farm, and uh, he has a water observatory there that I'm thinking that you folks should be aware of, but it's an ongoing uh, uh, concern. And I'm just wondering if if uh, if uh, the SSEA has any involvement in that, or, or would you like to reach out to them and, and see what's going on and see if you might be able to provide assistance to them? And Julie, if you can comment on that. Thank you, Your Worship. Through Your Worship to Deputy Mayor Cabral. Um, uh, yes, we uh, we have been approached, um, as actually most of our partners have been, to be involved in their um, their application to the uh, the NSERC, the, the federal research grant. Um, so our board in 2022 uh, did review that, did you know speak to their own uh, councils, and uh, we have provided a letter of support, not financial, but in kind. So. Um, to make sure that we're, you know, if there's information we can provide to their research um, that we've already got in-house, that uh, we can do that and to, you know, indicate where we felt that there would be some value or some added value if they could uh, uh, consider some of our, our interests in that research. Um, interestingly enough, Dr. Shadek was uh, one of our project participants early on in the 1990s with uh, doing tree planting and some uh, habitat restoration on his property. So we know his property well, and uh, we do communicate fairly often. And in fact, um, Aisha is our water scientist and um, Melissa have both been uh, the lead contacts for those researchers. So yeah, we certainly are working, uh, doing what we can to work with them without increasing uh, workload for our team. Thank you. Thank you. Council, are there any further questions or comments? Deputy Cabral. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just wondering, is there, a, a, I guess, two two parts to my question? Number one, just for my own personal uh, uh, knowledge, really, is there an overlap between um, in all areas that you are responsible for with the NVCA, or are there certain, um, I guess, certain uh, 
services that you provide that are similar to the NVCA in areas where they are not supplying those services? Go ahead, Julie. Thank you, through your worship, to Deputy Mayor Cabral. Um, there, um, I, I, I don't know in detail all of the services that NVCA would provide to you in their portion of your water or your, your municipality and their watershed portion of your municipality. I know a fair number of them. Um, we do offer similar services. We do not uh, regulate under the Conservation Authorities Act. Um, and so that's the service they would provide in our watershed portion for you um, that we don't provide. Our only regulatory role in our watershed is uh, what Melissa delivers through source water protection and, and risk management. Um, uh, some of the monitoring in those pieces would be similar. So they would likely be doing similar work in the other portion of the watershed. But again, it would be better for them, um, obviously, to speak to that. Um, and our staff do connect with their staff. They've, you know, we've certainly both got comparable people who uh, share information and can share some, some expertise when we've got questions or need different areas of expertise with each other. Um, and um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not familiar again if they are offering uh, climate action pieces uh, like the, um, the sustainable Severin Sound piece. So, um, but again, I would leave it up to NVCA to let you know if that's something that they're offering as well. Thank you, Julie. Any other questions or comments from Council? And seeing none, all those in favor? And that has carried. Thank you very much, Julie, Melissa, and Asia for being here with us. We appreciate all the information. Thank you for your time. At this time, I would like to call on the NVCA to make their presentation virtually to council. Uh, good afternoon, your worship, uh, members of council, staff that are present and uh, the audience, uh, Julie and your staff as well. It's our pleasure to be here to uh, speak to you today. Uh, Cheryl's bringing up our presentation right now on the screen and we're sharing it with you. You can move on to the next slide, please. So we've been in the operation of uh, Conservation Authority delivery since uh, for 63 years. The area that we work in, in the, our watershed is approximately 3,700 square kilometers in size, and it involves eight municipalities, of which we're happy to say one of our partners is uh, Springwater. Uh, we provide coverage to 543 square kilometers in the, uh, the township. Uh, on the slide, it notes 100%. Uh, we had a conversation with Jeff earlier, and I wanted to just make sure that we understand what the 100% is. And uh, this may also address the, uh, the Deputy Mayor's uh, former question to Julie, just as she ended her presentation. Uh, we provide regulatory authority. We have since early 2000s at the request of the uh, township. Uh, there was a legislative change in the province that allowed us to move uh, into the Severn Sound area uh, portion of your township. And we provide uh, hazard protection, flood protection, uh, monitoring, and uh, have no overlapping services with the uh, SSEA. We've worked very diligently with uh, CEO Smith and his staff, along with Julie and her staff, to identify quite clearly in the tripartite agreement. There's a breakout session, um, and I may point this out to the deputy mayor. If you look at that living document, it, it clearly identifies each and every opportunity that is provided by the NVCA and by the uh, SSEA. When we look at forestry planning, that's something that we do that's very similar. The only different thing that we provide to all 100% of the uh, SSEA area in Springwater and the uh, NVC area is the MTIP, which is a forest management plan, which we're, we are the re registered provider with the province to do that. So if a landowner wanted to go into a forest managed situation, that could be struck up with the NVCA. And that's something that the uh, SSEA doesn't have the ability to do at this time. So that's one thing that we do that's a little different. 
Um, the source water protection, you've heard the collaboration between Melissa and Ryan. Uh, Ryan brings well over 20 years of source water protection and intellectual property that he's collected over the years. And uh, he works quite uh, uh, excellently with the SSEA team there. So he's providing that in the other portion. And when we look at that 100%, it's a breaks out to about 80% that the NGCA covers in the township in, in that 100% and 20% coverage with the SSEA. But I just do want to rest assured that there, there are no duplicated services. We're in pretty good contact. Julie and I both sit on the uh, Lake Simcoe uh, 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 Watershed Source Protection Board Committee with uh, Lynn Dolan and Rob Baldwin. And uh, in fact, we just met last week. So we're quite aware of the things we do and the things we don't do. Next slide, please. I just want to touch on the vision, just we'll let you, you can self-read this one as you go through. I think it's something when you're reading through our document, it's important that you do look at the vision and mission that drives the NBCA. Next slide, please. So why do we have conservation authorities? If you move on, please. Uh, if you look at the situation here, we look at early in Simcoe County, the settlement area, there was a complete uh, I'd say forest drift stripping in a lot of the escarpment areas and a lot of the highland areas, the uh, oral moraine and, and the area around Minasing. So there was a, a very large deforestation that occurred. Yeah, so that was one of the original things that happened with uh, conservation authorities was uh, how do we address that through reforestation? Next slide, please. A big aspect of uh, the conservation authorities across Ontario, of which there's 36 agencies that work in the province, was uh, the aftermath of Hurricane Hazel. Uh, that, that horrific flood event that occurred, um, without these regulated areas being clearly identified and shared, and that information shared between municipal partners and the conservation authorities representing the province, uh, houses and infrastructure was allowed to be placed in areas where it was in harm's way. So it's something that I just think we should all be aware of. Since the advent of conservation authorities and agencies like the SSEA, we've been able to successfully keep people out of those areas. And uh, it's, it's proven. Like if you look at the flooding that's occurred in British Columbia this last winter, uh, I just want to say that the government of British Columbia has reached out to Conservation Ontario and they will be piloting conservation authorities within the province of British Columbia based on the successes that they've had of keeping infrastructure and people out of harm's way through flood events. Uh, next slide, please. Here you can also see the, the brush wake where water rushes in and takes out trees, the, the uh, erosion hazards that happen. Um, this is a, an area in Tottenham where the Tottenham Dam was built. Uh, you can see that even in 2017, the climate change that we have happening in, in our watershed right now, um, there was that torrential downpour where we had shots of the CBC standing uh, with farmers and, and uh, offshore workers standing in water that was over top, topping over potato plants. And there were carp, 15 to 18 inch long carp swimming over these 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 land crops. So again, that, that protection aspect, it's not that we can prevent a flood. No one can prevent a flood, but working with the municipal planning staff and working with the province, we can really forecast where these areas are gonna happen or potentially could happen and we can keep infrastructure out of there and out of harm's way. Next slide, please. Here again, and, and I'm sorry, I'm hitting you with the slide pictures, the flood pictures, but there's been a lot of action uh, in the government and how they're dealing with conservation authorities. And one of the things that they have identified is they want us to maintain that core value of flood protection. And here you can see, you know, it, it doesn't really worry about how big or how strong you are. Water wins when it runs across the landscape. Here's a huge bridge abutment completely washed out, the roads washed away. So you can see the damages that can occur. Next slide, please. So conservation authorities were created basically, as the slide says, under three fundamental principles, watershed-based jurisdictions, and local decision-making, and funding and partnerships. So in the early 90s, the government basically 
stepped out of funding conservation authority work and flood protection work, source water protection. They, they, they really took a step backwards and looked at what they were going to provide. Um, and there's been a movement since that time to have conservation authorities work with our municipal partners. We're at the boots on the ground, the municipal workers and the staff, the conservation authority. Uh, the government really doesn't have that live field staff that they used to have. They used to have a rich, rich inventory of staff that would be working on the landscape. That doesn't occur anymore. So both conservation authorities and the municipalities have taken up that gap. In our funding mechanism, about 52% uh, of our funding comes from the municipality. And the remaining funding, only 2% comes from the government. And when we raise the remaining funds for the NVCA's uh, budget needs. Next slide, please. So what's a watershed? Keep going, please, Sharon. Uh, I use this slide because I think it, it really successfully gives you a good visual on how the, the uh, Nottawa saga could run across the landscape. Imagine at the top of the landscape where you see that river coming down the hill, uh, beginning in Peel in the uh, uh, Oak Ridges Moraine. That's where the NVCA's watershed starts. We touch into a little nub just into Peel and we provide planning for Caledon in that area. Similar to the way we provide that planning regulation for the uh, uh, Springwater Township in the SSEA area. So we're doing that at both ends of our watershed. So the river works its way down through our 18 municipal partners uh, it's uh, augmented and fed by the escarpment and the streams that run out of the uh, Berry Highlands and then the Ora Moraine. And then further the escarpment to the west runs into the whole area, dropping water into the system. In the in, uh, area in spring water, one of the really unique features is the menacing wetland area. And in, in that's the largest land holding that the NBCA has. We have 6,000 uh, acres of land in the, the uh, uh, area that we look after, and the majority of that land is in the menacing wetlands. So we make our way down through spring water, and then we move into the jurisdiction of uh, Wasaga Beach and uh, strip into the uh, Georgian Bay. One of the programs that we work really diligently on is our stewardship program, and it's supporting now uh, salmonoid fishery of Chinook salmon that runs from Georgian Bay all the way back upstream where we're getting breeding fish in Agilitas, uh, south of 89 Highway. So it's amazing to see that, that work. And uh, that salmon fishery supports a $7 billion commercial, indigenous, and uh, private fishing industry on Georgian Bay. So the, the work that's done through Conservation Authority's work is, is vitally important to the commerce of the entire area as well. Next slide, please. So here's a picture where you can see the province of Ontario bordered by those great lakes and the uh, Lake Simcoe. And then you get a picture shot of the uh, Nottawasaga Valley watershed. So beginning down there in that little tip below Orangeville into Caledon and running up into uh, the Wasega Beach area and, and in the uh, Springwater and Oro to our northern portion of the watershed. Next slide, please. Here's a picture if you get an opportunity to see some of the uh, um, river system. The heavy blue system running is the Nottawasaga. And then we have several different river systems running across the area. Uh, also outlined in this slide, when you get a chance to read through the uh, slide deck, uh, you can see all of the different partners we have and where they're located around the, uh, the jurisdiction. Next slide, please. Uh, keep going there, Cheryl. Uh, we have over 50 plus employees. Uh, currently this year with uh, term employees, contract employees and full-time employees, we have uh, 50 employees, 50, almost 58 employees this year. Um, hydrogeologists, ecologists, foresters, um, planners, certified planners, uh, planning ecologists, lands technicians, uh, forest planting, uh, forest management directors as well. Uh, we're blessed to have within this uh, regime people that have worked on this landscape for upwards of 30 years. Uh, Byron Wesson, uh, who's just going to be retiring this year, is a resident of Springwater Township, lifelong resident, and he's ending a 35-year career here this, this year with the NDCA. Um, so 
that's important for people to realize. With these changes that have happened in the government, especially from Bill 23, um, it doesn't take into account the intellectual property that the NBCA has garnered over its 63 years of working with municipal partners. Uh, we work with planners and we work with uh, staff in our municipal uh, situation in a really, you know, it's, it's a mutually beneficial relationship. We can provide history that isn't readily available. When you go back and you bound a property by the municipal boundaries, look at spring water. If that's the only information you have is what happens within the boundaries of the municipality of spring water, you really are unarmed when it comes to what that river system can provide to your situation. For example, if the absorbent uh, qualities of the menacing wetland were removed and the water was allowed to just re free bore through the menacing wetland, down at the Oxbow in Wasega Beach, you could potentially see an increase of 1.85 meters of flow water above the existing water levels that are today. So if you've driven there, that would mean taking out the, the bridge system that's across River Road would probably wash the beachfront out on uh, the uh, south side of, or the north side of River Road. There could be horrific losses. So the decisions that are made by those 18 municipalities through a strategic watershed plan are important. And I think it's just important to note that the, all of the changes that have occurred most recently in the legislative changes in province, one of the things they identified was creating a strategic plan for integrated watershed management of the entire watershed. And uh, Ryan is going to be working on that plan. We started an integrated watershed management plan, which we brought out to over 300 stakeholders in uh, 2017 had it approved by our board. We're gonna be redoing that plan. And it's augmented with five-year incremental strategic plans and five-year budgetary plans. And then they tie into the current year budget. So we're trying to make this a live fluid document that can provide really vital and current information to our municipal partners. Next slide, please. So what are the key issues that are, are sorry, slide. My apologies to council. I'm having some technical difficulties. There you go. Yeah, just a breakdown of the municipal partners, partners that we provide levy to from our, our budget that you're seeing. We have our corporate services budget, uh, our planning and regulations budget, watershed science, uh, flood operations, environmental education, forestry, environmental stewardship and restoration and lands operations. If you go to the next slide, I'll start to take you through a little breakdown of some of the key things that we've accomplished. Next slide, please. Keep going. Keep going. So here you can see some of the, the uh, attacking uh, agencies that are on the landscape right now. The, the goby up there at the top, the zebra mussels, uh, the invasive species that are riding into the side. We're also facing in the landscape right now the uh, uh, outtake of uh, decrease of ash in our landscape. The emerald ash borer has been prevalent. And most recently, the spongy moth that's been active in our tree canopy that you see, especially attacking our oaks across the, the entire area. Uh, the SSCA has a very active uh, uh, invasive species program. We do as well. We work extremely uh, closely with uh, the uh, Georgian Bay shoreline groups, Collingwood and Wasega Beach, on the removal of Phragmites, and that's funded by uh, um, programs outside of the levy that we receive from the uh, Springwater Township. Next slide, please. 
Here you can see the, the tip of the escarpment of uh, uh, where our watershed bleaches out into the shoreline of Georgian Bay and the development that's happened there, a linear development along the bay from, from Thornbury all the way across to Tiny. You can see that, that challenges that are, are on the coastal waters. Uh, and you can see the aspect of, of how urbanization is, is removing the green spaces from within the landscape. So it's vitally important that the work both the NBCA and the SCCA do in protecting and maintaining these areas. It's one thing to go out and replant, but it's vitally important that councils and, and partners like ourselves and the SCCA, we work closely with you to help identify areas that are in need of protection within the watershed area. Those wetland areas, those provincially sensitive forests. For example, in the in menacing wetland right now, uh, with the new legislation, they've changed the way that they look at the uh, watershed wetland. So now you have to, you can't look at complex wetlands, which would be made up of uh, uh, many uh, groupings of smaller wetland areas to equal one large wetland. You have to look at wetlands that equal one significant size and not consider the multiple, many different uh, wetlands that can come together to provide that. Minnesota isn't just one big air, area of water. There's water, there's land, there's marsh, there's grass, there's trees. It used to be the largest silver maple canopy monoculture in North America. And we need to protect these wetland areas. So there's ways that the Conservation Authority can work with the uh, municipality to identify those key places. And I think the, met, the menacing is definitely one for you. Next slide, please. So here we're, we want to talk about Bill 23. Bill 23, a little a bit is uh, it's happening fast, really fast. Came into the legislation, and then on the 28th of December, uh, conservation authorities were contacted by the government saying that the legislative uh, language was developed and would be enhanced and begin on January 1st, 2023. So. Uh, Things that we're still going to be doing for the uh, from the conservation authorities aspect for you is uh, the continuance of that planning aspect for the development of hazards, identifying hazards and erosion hazards for you, uh, working on, on the flood management aspects of things, and continuing to do that and continue to do the source water. One of the things that they did identify and what they spoke to a little earlier was that wetland area and the natural heritage features, uh, we can no longer go into an agreement with you to provide comment on natural heritage features as they apply to the Planning Act. So that's one thing that's happened. But natural heritage features have always been uh, part of the municipality's workload. They've often reached out to us for that. And now they'll be reaching out to consultants and, and other people uh, and there's really been no transition period identified for the time change between you take it on and, and conservation authorities no longer do the natural heritage aspect. Um, so it's, it's a game in progress. I think the government's made these changes. And let's face it, we identify a housing problem across this province. Everyone cannot live in the GTA. We have to live across the entire province. So uh, I think good planning land use is, is wise and prevalent. We're here as a good partner to uh, help you as much as we can on the natural hazard, hazard areas under the letter of the law. And uh, we can identify consultants that may be able to work with you. And we have staff here that can still answer questions for you as well. And we have been reaching out to our staff and to the uh, uh, planning groups across the the entire watershed, as well as the CAOs. I personally sent out a directive to the CAOs identifying some of the information I just provided you here today. And our director of planning has reached out to individual planning teams across the entire watershed, uh, spring waters included, on how we uh, will progress forward. We're trying to develop universal language from all conservation authorities so that we're on the same page and we're delivering similar information. So there's, there's little confusion. But because of the differences in watersheds, not one watershed is exactly the same. There's going to be little nuances that are different across the 36 uh, CAs in the province of Ontario. Next slide, please. So here, a little program interview. You saw the slide of the 58 workers, and now we'll get into a little bit of uh, what they've done in the last uh, 2022. Next slide, please. 
So you talk about water sedge science in the SSEA uh, program, that source water protection. Again, I'll mention that Melissa and, and her staff and Ryan and her staff work very closely together to uh, monitor these things. Uh, we do risk management planning for nine delegated municipalities. We uh, completed a wetland analysis, uh, loss analysis for pre-settlement times, and it was completed. Uh, we also completed an NPCA land use layer that the municipal partners can use when they're doing their planning situations. We've initiated and developed the watershed scale natural heritage system, uh, something that we'll probably continue to do. And, you know, where the government has said we're not going to be speaking on planning issues of uh, natural heritage features. There's nothing to prevent us from going into a service level agreement where we identify those so that when development does come into those areas, you already have a very good working knowledge of where the natural heritage features are, where the wetland features are, and you can then make a very good guided decision on what features you want to keep within the landscape as they play into your own needs in your own municipality. We've completed analysis in support of Conservation Authority's watershed report cards. Uh, they're on our websites. We continue to monitor uh, daily the Nottawasaga watershed. We have sensors up and down the river system. Uh, we just cleaned out the Swaley drain on a project that we worked with Springwater on. And in that project, we'll be putting in three additional sensors in the Minnesing and in the Swaley drain that will identify waters coming down through the uh, northern part of the watershed down into the Nottawasaga through the Minnesing. We've also completed an externally funded projects in the town of Shelburne and the town of Collingwood uh, that we did. One of the major projects we did in Collingwood was on flood protection along the uh, Pretty River system. It's a floodway that uh, with the advent of that floodway system, the town was able to expand and develop a really uh, resourceful commercial area and more residential area that if this floodway wouldn't have come in, the town wouldn't have even been able to develop there. So that, that shows the science background that the NBCA can bring to the townships and to their town partners in identifying safe areas that they can build inventory and uh, infrastructure in. We also completed the 2022-2025 NBCA climate change strategy. We did a strategy in 2019 and uh, we've just updated that. It's available on our website. Uh, we've worked very closely with the city of Barrie and the city of Innisfil in developing this and trying to take into consideration the effects of climate change on Lake Simcoe, as well as the Georgian Bay areas and the river system itself running from Peel all the way up to Georgian Bay. Next slide, please. In our education program, uh, we're still coming back from COVID. Pre-COVID, we, we were seeing upwards of 12,000 students engaged in our programming. That dropped down to almost 5,700 uh, as a result of COVID. Uh, we've expanded our program to take on a grade four curriculum in the Simcoe County School Board, Public School Board. We're also delivering curriculum to the Simcoe County Catholic School Board. So we're a big part of the educational system in Simcoe County. We provide on-site services for learning here as well as uh, school visits. So uh, we also run summer camps that are very important, I think. Uh, we had a very, very special uh, new citizens camp that involved children from different countries that have immigrated into Canada. It's kind of cool when you've got a camp of kids and not one single child speaks English and you have their parents there with them. They're all learning that language and they're really rejoicing in what can happen in a woodlot. Like uh, Tiffin, if you've not been to Tiffin, is a wonderful sugar bush with trails throughout and ponds and streams and wetlands and very, very distinctive forest types within the, the uh, complex itself. So our educational system, I think, is important. If we can't get ahead of the game and educate young children about the importance of the environment, the importance of the work that we do, and, and why our municipalities that we live in have to consider what's, what's the right thing to do with the landscape, we're lost. So we're really proud to offer this educational programming. And, and we also offer corporate training and uh, resources for uh, business to come out and, and do leadership exercise work here at the Tiffin site and at other sites throughout the watershed. Next slide, please. 
In our stewardship and restoration services, uh, we've been very blessed in Ontario that in addition to the 2 billion tree program, they've created a wonderful grasslands program uh, and prairie reestablishment program across the province. So we, we've been very active in planting a lot of native grassland, grasslands and turning marginal or very non-productive land areas into habitat areas for uh, biodiversity, which is vitally important. Without that uh, biodiverse system, we all fail. So we've implemented a, lot, a really wide, wide range of uh, water quality and habitat improvement projects throughout the watershed. We planted in the stewardship program over 8,000 trees in the spring. Uh, we collaborated with the Friends of the Mad River to develop a restoration program, and we studied the, the river morphology in the Mad River all the way through to the township of Clearview. We released document, a documentary, a video documentary, which highlights the recreational economic benefits of cold water fisheries in the Nottawa Saga watershed. I spoke to that about the Chinook salmon fishing uh, situation. Uh, we work with Ontario Streams quite closely to uh, access funding that isn't available to us that we do through in partnerships. We try to bridge funding as best we can to enhance. For example, this stewardship program, from all 18 municipal partners, we receive approximately $250,000. But through our staff's ability to engage other funders and look at other areas of funding, we grow that program to an excess of a million dollars. So, you know, you, you're looking at yourself, well, should we support programs that support all 18 municipalities? It's just, it's supporting more than our own, our own municipal needs. Uh, I think it's vitally important that we look at what's the best benefit for the whole system. And we talked a little bit already in this talk about integrated watershed management. Vitally important that we continue to fund these uh, multi-shared services. So we've also been collaborated with uh, a lot of people and worked on a lot of trout distribution throughout the area. And we did that in your township this year, or last year, and we also did it in Mono. And, and really great reports coming back on, on uh, the trout fisheries in the Nato Saga and uh, some of the smaller tributaries and creeks. Wonderful, wonderful to see these fish making a really strong comeback in the watershed. Next slide, please. Our forestry program, we planted over 115,000 trees on 23 properties across the watershed. Uh, 61 acres of new forests were created. And during the course of conversations throughout the year, we'll have people say, well, why are you doing forest planting on agricultural land? Uh, when we do forest planting on agricultural land, it's usually class seven or class eight land, which is in the productive aspect of things, you, you know, probably better suited to growing rice than soybeans or corn. Um, so we're really, we are cognizant of the types of land situations that we put in. We're trying to go in and plant land that is adjacent to uh, areas that where there may be riparian banks, where there could be water rush and runoff, stream rise in the spring that may cause tremendous erosion and send tremendous amounts of sediment into the river. We're looking at developing tree buffers around really highly commercial agricultural operations so that we can filter some of those nitrates out of the, uh, out of the uh, soil runoff and into the soil to prevent it from hitting the streams and, and causing problems there. Also, that would speak to phosphorus delivery as well. We're looking at developing ways that we can plant in those situations. Uh, again, I want to highlight the MTIP program. It's that forest management program that we offer through the province. And through that program, we managed over 700 hectares of forest this year and worked with over 35 landowners who chose to develop forest managed areas on their area. Uh, one of the things that we, we may be coming to Springwater as well as our other 18 municipalities is, is a look at how we can partner on reducing road salts and how one way that we can partner on reducing road salts is by developing a really uh, intricate windbreak system along some of the north, south and east, west running roads so that we can keep that snow drift off and reduce the amount of uh, snow salt and sodium into the landscape going to be vital as we grow forward. We're a Great Lakes, some of the purest water, we're the stewards of the largest freshwater basin in the world. And if you pick up a paper today, you can probably find an article about sodium levels and the amount of road salt that's being distributed. So, you know, by working in a, in a forestry program with either Julie's team or our team, we could develop windbreaks that may be able to keep large deposits of snow off the roads, reduce the number of passes for transportation down the highway, and reduce the uh, need for heavy, heavy application of sodium to the property. Next slide, please. 
So this is the, the cornerstone of conservation authorities is flood management. Um, we monitored flood and low water conditions along with ice conditions. The new government program also calls for uh, conservation authorities to develop an ice management program where needed. Uh, we'll see that along the shoreline of Georgian Bay more than any other area. Uh, municipal partners are still the, the go-to partner for things that happen in the river, like tree snags or ice jams. We work with you to try to identify when they might be coming and, and how we might best manage them. And uh, when we develop an ice management plan, which our engineer Mark Hartley is working on, it will be available in 2024. We've inspected and operated uh, many flood structures and erosion control structures across the watershed. We further developed a uh, criterion for Georgian Bay shoreline as a warning statement. You know, that 2017 flood was a real eye opener for us. It happened in June. And when you think of spring flooding, we think of the ice release and the, the fresh where the river lets up its ice and flows into the Georgian Bay as being a one-time spring event. Climate change has, has queer, correctly, correctly identified that that's not gonna continue as a one instance. It's gonna happen in many multiple instances over the cold calendar year. We can have free thaws in the winter. Uh, we can have high water flows and storm flooding. So it, it's just going to make the need for monitoring more vital and more important. So in that said, we reviewed site-specific flood hazards. We've done assessments and studies along with mapping. We're continually doing mapping. And you can see in the, uh, the work, that the really good work that Simcoe County's done in, in their CR planning, uh, they looked at uh, the natural heritage features, they looked at the streams, they've taken a break, they really want to analyze that, they really want to make sure that they get the natural heritage features right in that mapping application so that we know what waters are, are potentially causing problems, and that's some of the work that we can provide through our GIS and, and team. Uh, we have three engineers that are on staff and an engineering technician, um, very blessed to have a senior engineer with over 30 years experience, not just in our watershed, but in the Grand River and then across Ontario. He worked in both the private sector and he's worked for uh, multiple conservation authorities over time as well. So as always, we're trying to create and enhance our data management so we can provide more data to our partners so that you can have uh, live data and, and really understand what water systems are doing. So the flood management is a very, very important part of our piece. And keeping in mind that just a few years ago, the funding by the province to flood management controls was reduced by 50%, $97,000 of our budget was removed. And then you're told it's the core work that you have to do. So we do have to work resiliently with our partners, our municipal partners in finding strategic ways to fund flood programs. In the end, it benefits everyone that lives in Ontario that's building infrastructure. Next slide, please. In our planning and development, we continue to look for opportunities to streamline that process. Permitting is something that's just growing and growing and growing. When I arrived here in 2017 and took on this role as CAO, we were doing under 2,000 permits. We're now doing over 6,000 permits with the same staff. I think we're, we're, we're kind of at the... Uh, the end of the game. The government has identified 90 day turnaround as the maximum time for us to deliver those plans. In 2017, we were delivering many of those, those permits seven to 10 days. Now we're pushing that 90 day window because there's just such a flush of development and that development flush is not going to disappear. It's going to continue. And your staffs are seeing it as well in your work that increased number of people coming in and, and in trying to get information. So again, I'm going to touch back on Bill 23 because it speaks to many of the acts which are down identified on this slide. Uh, Bill 23 if reduces the ability for us to speak to or comment on some of those acts. So there'll be reduction in some of the natural heritage feature aspects in, in how we do that. One of the things with integrated management and working for 18 municipalities, it's not a big cost reduction for us. It, it, it's minimal, if that, uh, as a result of how we share our knowledge over 18 municipalities and we receive funding for those positions. Um, natural heritage feature, as I spoke to originally, is always been in the billywhack of the uh, municipalities. And 
your choice to do with the NBCA in the past has been removed from you now on that aspect, and you'll be reaching out to uh, potentially uh, contract providers or taking on staff of your own. But if you look at, uh, I have an ecologist that does our, our natural heritage feature planning, and that covers 20% of their time. That's one person at 20%. Now we're asking 18 municipalities to hire 18 individuals to deliver that 20% to their municipal system. Um, it's not really good math, and I'm hoping that there's ways that the conservation authorities can continue to work with our municipal partners, at least through side of the desk conversations for now on how we can assist you best. We are your partners. We want to work with you to develop the strategies and, and uh, ways to do it, and we want to honor the letter of the law. That, that's what we do. We interpret legislation. We look at how those regulations come out and we deliver the product that's based on the regulatory need that, that comes out of the governmental changes. And that's where we are right now. Um, we also want to point out that we have undertaken a private uh, report through Watson and Associates. And I know many municipal uh, councillors are very familiar with Watson and how they've worked with municipalities across the province of Ontario. I'm not sure if they've done work with Springwater. I think they may have, but I'm not 100% certain on that. But we're looking now at um, really looking for efficiencies and how we can best manage our staff, whether or not we need more staff, whether we need to reduce staff and move them into other job locations. But we're doing this on our time, trying to make sure that we are delivering the proper needs and wants of our conservation partners and our municipal partners. So our mid-year reporting, I just want to say here, is identified that uh, we're hitting our timelines at a 96% level. If we all go back to school and we came home with a report card of 96%, I think mom and dad would be pretty happy with that. Um, and that's looking at going from uh, under 2,000 permits to over 6,000 permits in a fiscal year. So the volume of work and the ability to get work out the door, for me, is amazing. I, I think we're really trying hard. Of course, as councillors and new people to council, you're going to have individuals reach out and say, oh, I've been waiting months, or I've been waiting and waiting and waiting, or developments waiting and waiting, or we started this development five years ago. Large-scale development process is a long process. It, it may start with an idea, it may lay dormant for a number of years, but one thing that's quite often not expressed to the municipal partner is a permit request comes in, we turn the permit request around in seven to 10 days, and it goes back to the proponent. Then the proponent takes six months to deal with that. They, haven't, they can't answer the questions. And then they return it to the NBCA and immediately phone their municipal counselor and say, I've been waiting six months. It's been six months since I developed this project, where in reality, that may not be the truth. So there's opportunities for us to really work on that partnership aspect of how we deliver that information to each other. And, and the phone lines are open and our planning uh, department has a great relationship with Springwater's planning department and Jeff's team. Uh, it's always a pleasure to work with the staff at, at Springwater and I hope that continues in the future. Next slide, please. Conservation lands, uh, we do that under section 28 and the section 28 regs haven't really changed a lot uh, recently. We've got a few things that we've got to put in place. We need to identify uh, potential property on our land space that may be available for housing. So we will be doing that over the course of the 2023 year. We'll also be doing a land management strategy and we'll be providing an inventory. Then all of the work the government has asked us to do is completely transparent and available on our websites or will be when it's finished on our websites, as well as all the communication that we make to our uh, partners is, is on our websites through our board meetings and uh, the public can attend our board meetings. So transparency is something that we're really, really working on. And uh, I, I think it's important that we understand that we're land managers, but what are the lands that we own? When a development happens, quite often, they try to build out those rectangles, as many rectangles on the property as they can and, and take 100% advantage of developable property. When the whole development is completed, there's little pieces that stick out that aren't developable, that maybe the county doesn't want to assume into their land inventory. Municipality may not want to take them onto the land inventory. These are the land pieces that come into the, the uh, management of the conservation authorities. We quite often take on those pieces, tie them into other green areas and try to maintain them as a whole. 
So it's not that we're getting pristine land that is going to see development on. Uh, I don't think you'll see a lot of development on many of the MDCA properties. Um, we will do the letter of the law and make sure all of the information is provided to government at, at the time when we complete our inventory. But uh, um, the one thing about having these land areas and these conservation areas across the watershed is, and I think everyone can understand what these natural areas did during the pandemic. People got outside after being house locked for quite some time and really appreciated the value that's in our area. Um, there's some wonderful properties in Springwater area that are managed by the NBCA that people have been enjoying for years and will continue to enjoy. And again, we work closely with Jeff and his team to identify ways that we might be able to enhance those uh, recreational opportunities. So we'll continue to do that in the future. Uh, we've gone to a parking system that's uh, an app system that supplies a lot of uh, funding for our lands program. We have the ability for people to access parking, pay for it immediately on the time, at the time they're there, or they can take out the land pass and use it over the course of the season. And these are all offsetting revenues that go into that other 50% of the funding that drives the NDCA programming in a year round delivery. Um, many systems have challenges with, with the parking situation. We're very happy to say that we've been very successful. We just changed our uh, funding provider for that but it's allowed us to keep cars off municipal roads, keep people safe and let them get out and enjoy lands properties. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna pass this on to Cheryl right now. And she's gonna take you through uh, some of the 2023 focuses and a little bit of the budget numbers for you. And then that will bring our uh, presentation to an end. We have probably about five or six more slides for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sierra. Um, and to a uh, mayor and council, thank you for letting us be here today. Um, I'm going to start here by saying I'm sorry for the technical difficulties earlier. I believe that my computer has decided that since budget time has been completed, it wants to stop working. Um, I think I overworked it for a few weeks. Um, but I'm going to start off by talking about the 2023 focus and kind of looking forward is what are our plans for 2023? Um, CIO Hebner has spoken a lot about the new regulations, Bill 23, um, and there's a lot of, of legislative change that has occurred over the last uh, 12 to 13 months, um, and that's going to result in um, some MOU discussions with your municipality, um, as well as a change in our budget to format for 2024. Um, so that's going to be a big uh, portion of our, our workload for 2023. Um, we're going to also continue to follow Bill 23 and any subsequent ERO's and monitor those impacts, um, similarly to what Doug has already spoken to. Um, we're also going to continue to coordinate and implement their integrated watershed management uh, plan and strategic plans. And again, as, as um, our CAO mentioned, we are looking to update our integrated water, watershed management plan this year. And as always, we're going to continue to work diligently to continue to try and improve client service and accountability, increase the speed of our approvals, uh, reduce the red tape and the regulatory burden. We do agree with the provincial government that steps need to be made, and we're doing what we can um, at our level. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we're not jeopardizing the public health and safety of the environment or our public health in the process. So just quickly uh, speaking to the NBCA's budget, um, there are two parts to the NBCA's budget. There's our general operating levy and then our asset management levy. Um, so the first part is our operating levy. Um, and as you can see from the 2022 approved budget, um, last year you contributed $198,749. And we're proposing an increase of just over $12,000 to a total operating budget request of $211.73. So Doug has spoken to this a little bit throughout his, his uh, part of the presentation about how we take the funds that the municipalities give us and how we grow that. Um, so Springwater's investment of 211,000 is part of what other municipalities contribute towards as our levy, which is just over 50% of our total amount. 
We then get a very tiny 2% amount from the province. We also apply for specific grants from the federal government, um, and we do get some a small portion from them as well. We also apply for a ton of different um, privatized grants, and uh, we are also very successful in those. And then we also do um, have user fees, um, fundraising, et cetera, that helps to grow our total budget to just over $5.6 million. Um, our 2023 budget overview impact on residents. So one of the things that we really like to do is, is take a look at how it, are we impacting an individual resident. Um, there's a few different ways to look at how our levy is done. Um, our levy is realistically, it's calculated through the current value assessment. Um, however, what we do is we take the number that's given to us in that for municipal population. <laughs> Um, and we also calculate kind of what is the per, per resident cost. Um, and the total for 2023 would be uh, $13.62 um, in total. And you can kind of see around that circle how that's further broken down. Um, so as previously mentioned, we also have an asset management levy. Um, our first asset management plan was created and approved in 2016 for our 2017 implementation. We then spent the next five years doing a full implementation um, and became fully um, implemented in, sorry, three years, we said three years to fully implement and came into full implementation in 2020. Um, so Springwater's asset management contributions are going to be $9,247 for 2023. That is down from the 10,330 that was um, received in 2022. And that is due to a, a couple of factors. The first one is the CVA adjustments um, for um, the levy breakdown, as well as savings that staff found within our capital purchases. And then below is just a few of the uh, scheduled capital projects that we do have on plan for 2023. Um, some pretty standard ones like our computer and server upgrades that we continually have to do um, small amounts each year. Um, we also need to make sure that we're um, doing any sort of um, repair work or replacement of some of our end of life flood and monitoring equipment. And then some pretty big ones that we're doing is we are doing a, a dike safety review for our Pretty River Dike. Um, which is up in the Collingwood um, area. As Doug had mentioned previously, we've done a, a significant amount of work up in that area in the last couple of years. Uh, so we need to do a dike safety review for that. And then we also need to do a dam safety review at the Tiffin Conservation Area and do some maintenance of the new Lowell Dam from information that came from the last dam safety review there. So our total requests from Springwater um, for 2023 is $220,320. Um, that is a difference of $11,241 over 2022. So at that point, uh, that's the end of our presentation and we'd be happy to take any questions um, once you deem appropriate, Mayor Coughlin. Uh, thank you, Doug and Cheryl. Council, may I have a mover and seconder to receive the presentation from the NBCA? Deputy Cabral and Councillor Fisher, that the presentation from the Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority regarding the 2023 budget request be received, and that the 2023 NVCA operating levy request in the amount of $211,073.28, representing Springwater's share, be referred to the January 20th, 2023 budget session for further consideration, and that the 2023 NVCA asset management levy request in the amount of $9,246.52, representing Springwater share, be referred to the January 20th, 2023 budget session for further consideration. Council, at this time, I'd like to invite any questions or comments. It's always... <laughs> Come on, somebody else can go first for once. All right, Deputy Cabral. Thank you, Mayor Coughlin. Um, and uh, I guess observations too. I, um, I thank you for the presentation. Um, there's a lot of very valuable programming that's gone into it. It's nice to see that you're looking at, uh, in particular, the parking for some revenue streams there as well. But I, I think 
if I were to break it down, there's uh, what I might say are invisible aspects to the NVCA, things that, uh, you know, um, nobody seems to mind, you know, the planting of trees, farmers engaging in that, uh, some of the things that people don't see that the NVCA does. However, I can tell you that um, uh, the folks that call me, and I would suspect maybe some other members of council, uh, tend to be with respect to things that they've reached out to ask the NVCA to do. In particular, I'm going to have to focus on the permit aspect of things. And uh, I, I guess their feeling is that in today's day and age, you know, it's uh, manufacturing for automobiles just on time. You know, you want something for Amazon, it's there the next day. And I guess that's what they're starting to grow accustomed to. Uh, and while I do agree that it's pretty good and it looks really good to say that we have a 96.4% uh, rating, 90 days is still a long time, I think, for in, in my particular case, it's mostly been uh, rural people, uh, particularly farmers that are trying to develop a bit of a business plan. And maybe they're putting up a coverall, maybe another uh, pig pen or a, a broiler barn or whatever. Uh, and uh, it seems to be that they're the ones that um, the lack of getting this turnaround time accomplished in time is adversely affecting them, as opposed to, as Mr. Hevner pointed out, you know, larger developers who, yeah, they might sit on something for a long time and, and then try later on to say that <clears throat> NVCA is dragging their heels when really they've been doing it themselves. So I, I am very happy to hear that you're looking at trying to speed the processes up. But I'd have to say that that would be the one thing um, that, uh, from my standpoint here in Springwater, that I've heard from our, our uh, in particular, like I say, the rural residents, although I have also heard from the odd, uh, you know, resident in town that happens to be, say, by the, by the Nottawa Saga or, or the Y River, I should say. So, um, uh, Mr. Hebner, I'm just wondering if you might have through uh, Deputy Cog uh, Mayor Coglin any comments on that and on, on how you can see that, uh, I guess, being speeded up for the, the small fry, the small people who are looking for the NBCA for some, uh, some assistance. CEO Hebner. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship, uh, through the Deputy Mayor, if I may. Um, I can look at the one that really comes to mind and, and an opportunity uh, that we were provided with to provide permitting to a large broiler uh, barn that was being developed on 92. Uh, you know, you, you, you and I have both referenced we have up to 90 days to do it. Uh, we turned that permitting process around 31 days. That's, that still isn't fast enough. If I delivered it in five days, it still wouldn't be fast enough. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the challenge that when you're the, the proponent that says no, it's really challenging. Um, and when we face that, it's, it's communication. The biggest challenge we face as an agency when we look at a permit from ground zero to moving it out the door is incomplete submission. We'll get a list of 10 items in. We'll say to the people, thank you very much for your 10 items. Uh, we need additional information on one through three. And we'll send that back to them. And they'll try to turn it around and get it back to us. They don't do anything about one, two, three. They submit four through 10 and then 12 through 17 and ask, why isn't their permit ready? The permit's still not going to deliver until you deliver the whole package, all of the items that need to be addressed. And it, it sounds like a, uh, you know, we're stepping out of the blame on this. We're not stepping out of the blame on this. We're, we're happy to have this conversation and identify some of these things. Uh, we work really closely with our partners and our development proponents are our partners. And it, it's communication that's going to help make the process happen faster. It's really either that or put more bo bodies on it. I, I come from a very large municipality in Edmonton where we went to the one storefront. If you wanted to do something with the city of Edmonton, you went to one kiosk and you get every bit of delivery. Gosh, I wish we could do that where somebody walked up to your municipal kiosk and could have all the answers from the NVCA at that one day. Maybe we will get there someday as a collective, but right now it, it's, it's still a learning process and a challenging one at that at times. I agree. Thank you and, and follow on. And I do have an additional question on top of that after. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Hebner. Um, uh, and I do, I do appreciate the comments that you've made there. I know it's always uh, not going to be one-sided. I mean, there's two sides to every coin. However, I, I, I'm going to have to just uh, bear it and say I am ignorant of the entire process in some ways. And I was just curious to know, uh, based on <clears throat> the initial application when it comes to the NVCA, is it rated in any way, shape, or form as to the uh, critical aspect of that particular parcel of land and what they want to do? Um, saying you're really close to the river or you're 1,500 feet away from the river, is 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 there a bit of uh, uh, some weight uh, attributed to that? Theo uh, Thank you, Your Worship. Through Your Worship to the Deputy Mayor. Um, we vet every permit that comes in and we look at are there ways to expedite this process? We, we've got a regulations team that we're delivering. You got to remember, we're, we're not just delivering this in spring water. We're delivering this same type of process to 18 different municipalities. So it's like if every, every municipality sends us in an application, that's 18 applications immediately. So there's a queue we have to establish because it's really the only way you can work through this type of, of permit process. But that said, our regulations team have seen a very, very wide variety of applications and they've dealt with different files and they go, aha, this is just like the one we looked at in Wasega Beach. Our engineer doesn't need to look at it. I'm gonna to refer to that file I can, and they can move that through the queue. You can just walk it downstairs and say to the engineer, we can kick this one out the door if I get your sign off on this today. We tried to do that, but it's a challenge to do that when you've got a huge multi-million dollar project on the go that you have council have deliberated on for a number of years to make it happen. Say Midhurst, for example, 6,000 new housing starts. You want to see that project move forward. You want to see it develop. You know, you, you can't really move stuff around in the queue where there's opportunities to do it. We certainly try to. So I hope, I hope that answers your question, sir. Uh, thank you. And uh, CAO Hebner, uh, on top of Deputy Cabral's question about the 96% within 90 days, is there a breakdown further to that by service partner? So my question would be in spring water, what is the percentage and how long of the 90 days were your targeted goal? What was the percentage to spring water specifically? I don't know that I, I have, I don't know that we have yet broken it down by municipality. We may have, I can certainly get back to you on that, your worship. And uh, if we have that detail, I can provide it but we break it down by each specific item of all the delivery services we provide and we look at the timing on that. So um, I, I can get back to you on that if that's uh, applicable. Thank you. You're welcome. Other members of council for question or comment? Deputy Corral, do you wanna just go back and forth between the two of us or? Go right ahead. All right, uh, moving specifically to the Minasing wetlands, um, understanding that there is new parking meters put up there. Uh, has there any been any discussion about wayfinding or canoe launches to uh, provide a better experience to those using it? Also, there is quite the cost to the municipality and other groups when we do need to either put a helicopter in there or have our first responders go in to assist those who have become lost. We really looked hard, uh, pardon me, through your worship, if I may respond to your question. We, we've looked very hard. Byron, as uh, when, when those first responders are out there looking, the first call they make is to Byron Wesson. And uh, that's going to be a big shoe to fill when he retires in 2023. Um, he intimately knows the system. Uh, connectivity through online systems and, and, and uh, GPS tracking is difficult within the menacing. The waterscape in the menacing changes by the minute when, when people are in there. Uh, we certainly have tried through the way of signage to identify to people and to explain to them on our website that this is not a place for a novice to jump into a canoe and go for a fun hour paddle. You can go two hours down the stream and get lost, like if you put in at the canoe canal, canal corral. Um, we're looking, Your Worship, um, and we work uh, quite closely with the OPP on this situation, but I don't have any fast answers at this time. Thank you. You're welcome. And then I'm trying not to repeat the same questions that I've been asking for multiple years, um, but I will ask again, the revenue received to the NVCA by residents or stakeholders within 
spring water, what was the revenue generated to NVCA through permit fees? I don't have that answer off the top of my head. That's a new question for me, but. Uh... No, I've been asking it for about five years. Same question. Mm. The, they're on your sh on the slide when you showed different funding sources. And um, I'm assuming that permitting fees would have been part of the min min sorry miscellaneous, or is there a total that you would be able to indicate on the permit fees received from individuals, residents, or stakeholders to the NBCA? We have it for the entire municipality, a percentage of our revenues on that. We'd have to look and see if we can dig out the detail on particular municipal partners. Be happy to look into that for you. But uh, we do in a pie chart that we do there, we show you how much revenue we generate from permitting. And you would be able to break that back down again, specific to spring water upon request? Potentially, I possibly. I'm, I can't speak to that right at the moment. Uh, Cheryl, maybe you can step in on that one and, and uh, identify that. Sorry, Your Worship. Director Flanagan, Flanagan sorry. Yeah. Through the mayor, and um, that's definitely something we can look into. I don't have the reports run at this moment, but what we'll do is we'll get those reports and we'll get them emailed off to the clerk and to yourself so you can distribute them to council. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Council, are there any additional comments or questions? And seeing none, all those in favor? And the motion has carried. Thank you again very much for being here with us today. Thank you for the opportunity. Have a lovely day and happy new year to you all. Thank you. Council, at this point, we can take a quick recess as I, we have CAO Delgado come up to the front here. So we'll just take a quick recess here.
All right, Council, thank you for joining us back here. At this point, I will call on Jody Player Delgado, CEO, to make her presentation on behalf of the Springwater Public Library. Jody, welcome. Thank you very much. And through you, Your Worship, and to all the members of Council, I can't tell you how happy I am to be back in person in Council Chambers to share the budget estimates for the Springwater Township Public Library Board for 2023. So if you give me one moment, I will share my screen so it comes up for everybody and begin my presentation. Awesome. The library has been very active in the last few years, even throughout COVID and in 2022 especially. I don't know if everybody has been into every branch yet. I know I've seen many of you in some of our branches, but we do have three, Elmville, Midhurst, and Minasang, and we have 13 wonderful staff. So I thought I would give you a brief tour. It's about a three, just over three minute video. So you can see each branch as I can't take you in person from here. So actually I realized I probably forgot something. <laughs> Let me just go back again. try this again and hopefully this will work and you'll be able to hear the sound. And it worked when I practiced all day today. And there's no sound. So give me a second. I have another way of sharing. And for some reason now it's not coming up with my video. That's not coming up with it. We practiced this multiple times yesterday and today, and of course now it's not working. So I will just go back and skip that slide. And please come in when you are available, and I will give you the tour in person and introduce you to all of our staff. We do have a wonderful library with lots of different things in it, and I can't wait to share all of them with you. Now it's not moving forward. Are you seeing anything from there, Renee? Is that going right? And I go to Zoom. Share screen. Share sound is on. From the beginning. Still no sound, even though the sound is on. So I'll skip there. Anyways, like I said, come back and see our wonderful library and we will put that video up on our website so you can access the library's website and see the video on your own okay as this is the first time i have spoken before this council i would like to take a step back and share a little bit about how public libraries are governed in the province of ontario we do have our own act the public libraries act and this outlines all the statutory requirements, regulatory requirements for libraries in Ontario. It outlines the conversation, composition of the board, how meetings are to be held, the duties of the chief executive officer, the CEO, and what we can charge for. So public libraries in Ontario are not allowed to charge for public access to the building. They're not allowed to charge for people to take out materials. We are allowed to charge for people from outside units our own municipality and set our own fines and fee structures and rentals of rooms. So it is very regulated on what we can and cannot do. 
It also says that council is to appoint our board members. So thank you very much. We had our first board orientation meeting yesterday. We have a great board. I'm looking forward to working with a new one. And it also requires libraries to present their estimate of sums for each year to council for approval. So thank you very much for allowing me to be here today to do that. And to break it down a little bit more, the governing authority for the library is our library board. So we have our new board that has been established and they outline what we can and cannot do. So they have all the governing authorities, the policy, the budget, the oversight, and then the daily operations have been delegated to the CEO, who is the manager of all the daily operations. So the library board is the ultimate authority for any decisions regarding the library. So oftentimes people may come to you with questions about the library. So in that case, just refer them or ask myself or a member of the library board to bring it forward. And also the library board follows the Ontario Library Association statement on intellectual freedom. So we are a place that is open to everybody and provide materials for everybody. And that is one of our core values. A lot of people think that the library is actually a department of the municipality. And it's easy to think so because we have a very similar name. We are in township buildings. So our facilities are owned by the township and we work quite closely with the township of Springwater. So we share, um, we work with staff on projects. We use some of their finance and HR services and we share resources because in many cases it makes sense to share resources and also come coordinate on programs because it's more expensive for the library to do it on their own or it's more expensive for the township to do it on their own. So by collaborating, we can provide better service to all the residents. Up until the end of last year, we were members of the Simcoe County Library Cooperative, which was disbanded. However, the county is retaining digital services for all of the libraries, which is great because it allows us to offer items that we could not afford on our own. So we take advantage of the cost sharing benefits of being with the county. They provide our integrated library system, which is all of our cataloging and circulation platform. So allowing us to actually check in and out books and catalog books and all of our other materials. Our eBooks that we offer would be a much, much smaller um, collection size if we didn't partner with the county because eBooks are actually quite expensive. They're about double the price of regular print books in most cases. We have more databases than we could afford on our own. And the county also provides our IT support. So when we need computer help, we call the county. And they have also previously provided new to us refurbished computers, which makes up the majority of our public and staff computers. So they're the refurbished ones from the county. So we are very thankful to them. A question I often hear, why libraries? In the age of the internet, why do we still have libraries? And I mean, obviously I'm probably a little bit biased as I'm sitting before you in my position, but there have been studies done on the benefits of libraries. Uh, one done a few years back in Ontario, it didn't cover every Ontario library, but about 16 or 18 libraries. And it was a return on investment. And it found that for every dollar put into a library, $5.39 on average was returned back to the community. And in this, they looked at the cost of collection and the circulation of the collection, the benefits from the programs, the cost of the program, staffing, materials, and the benefits people receive from those programs, the availability of technology, so people coming in to use computers, the direct spending of the library itself in the community, and the indirect spending of library staff, many of whom are members of the community and live and shop in the community. And so that's how they came up with that $5.39 figure. Other studies have shown that libraries are good anchor tenants in the community. And if you look at the Elmville branch, for example, because that one is located right on the main street of the village of Elmville, you'll see that a lot of residents come to the library and then they either shop or dine or visit a recreation facility before or after their library visit. So it's drawing people to downtown. So that is one of the other benefits. As well, as libraries are open to all in the community, they do provide the sort of social hub. During COVID, some of my staff members called 
are more vulnerable patrons to ensure that they were safe and that they had the information they needed. We find that people come in to get warm in the winter or stay cool in the summer. Lonely people come in sometimes multiple times in a day just for that human connection. So the library is providing all this, as well as access to social services, such as early on for the younger children, tax services, YMCA help. And if we know spring water, we know we're surrounded by larger communities. So people have to draw to these larger communities to get access. And some people don't have transportation. So the fact that the library can help facilitate that is another benefit. So a little bit more in depth of what we have done. So 2022 was super exciting. We returned to face-to-face -face programs in branch, as well as we reopened Minnesing. The Minnesing branch had been closed and only opened for curbside during the pandemic. And so we actually were able to reopen it to public access. We'd had lots of people coming for curbside, but everybody's happy to actually be back in branch. And with all of our online programs, we still kept them, but we have face-to-face. -face. Summer reading program, virtual component, face-to-face -face programs. We had several outdoor large events, one in Midhurst, one in Alville. And we had the highest numbers of participation ever for our summer reading program. We also want to thank our local businesses and especially the Spring Water Vespa Lions Club who has been a sponsor of our summer reading program for I don't know how many years at this point. And they provided many of the prizes. STPL is also becoming known among Ontario libraries for being a library leader for dyslexia-friendly libraries. Members of staff spoke at conferences this year. I was asked to be the Ontario representative to an American-led committee on dyslexia-friendly libraries. We also increased our collection of decodable and accessible books and are the point source of contact for many people who are looking for more information on dyslexia which does affect up to 20% of the population. So if up to 20% of the population cannot read the books in our library, we feel it is our job to help them come in and get better with literacy. So open to members. We also provide printing and faxing, computer access, mobile internet hotspots, which have been very popular over the last few years, let me tell you. Simcoe County bus passes for those who need the transportation. There's so much more, the, this is only the tip of the iceberg for what the library provides. To get into numbers, in 2022, we had 64,864 checkouts of physical materials. 35,423 people came through the doors of our three branches. 815 people were on computers, which is lower than it normally is. 6,048 participated in our face-to-face -face programs, and then we spoke to another 3,570 people at our outdoor events or at our school outreach. 28,733 people hit our public Wi-Fi, and that's both indoor and you can access it outdoor. So sometimes you drive my Midhurst and you see people in their cars downloading videos or downloading eBooks because we know there's parts of this township where internet is very spotty. The number I'm very proud of is 157,535 views of our online video programs. They took off this summer. So that was extremely exciting that Miss Amanda became a virtual story time star for a while. We also have a library app, which saw 6,218 uses of it during the year. And I don't think I need to tell you how excited we were to get back out into the community so people could see us again. We were at the Elmville Sci-Fi Fantasy Festival, Elmville Fall Fair, Midhurst Autumn Fest, the Springwater Farmers Market in Elmville. We even were able to take some of our programs outside of the branch, as well as being invited back to kindergarten welcomes, uh, Tiny Family Fun Day. So it's just so nice to be able to go out and see everybody again. So, Following up 2022 will be hard, but we'll give it our sh best shot. There are several things that we are planning for 2023. Our Battle of the Books program, I'm very happy to say, is back in business. So we had implemented this. It's a trivia program for children in grades four, five, and six at our local schools. And they sort of have a face-off to see who knows the most about books. 
missing one prior to the pandemic. And we have more schools have signed on this year. So that is kicking off right now. We're going out to do school visits to get all the children excited about reading. We are also very happy to be a, have been a part of the surveys, community surveys for the community hub last spring. The library staff helped facilitate those in our branches and making introductions. And we can't wait to hear what else is planned for the project as that moves forward over the next few years. We are really interested in revamping the Yamba branch. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. I don't know if you have been into the Yamba branch lately. It is really showing its age and it cannot provide everything a modern library should be able to provide nowadays. So we will be discussing that later on in this presentation. And I hate to admit a weakness, but we Springwater Library has had a weakness and that is in our technology offerings. So we are asking for laptops to help promote technology, to provide more access to technology, and then to be able to provide some of the computer programs that we really should have been doing in the meantime. So for the financial implications, our estimates for 2023 are $1,022,086 for our expenses. And then the municipal portion of that would be $904,586 with the library bringing in some revenue from the amounts that we are allowed to under the Public Library Acts. The program changes are for the laptops, and then we do have two capital S. So to break down our increase in operating revenue, the majority of the increase is due to staffing costs. So for the COLA, as well as the merit increases on the pay equity grid, our statutory deductions such as PPP, OMERS, and WSIB, we do have a small increase in our actual operating expenses that are non-staff related, and those are primarily driven by inflation. We do have an increase in collection costs, which is more than our normal increase, which is why I mentioned it here. It is covered by development charges under our development study, so it's not a tax increase, but it is also driven by, first off, the increase in cost of books, because those have gone up, as well as we are no longer receiving those physical collections that we used to do from the county, as the county is now only providing digital services. So we are trying to make up a little bit of that. So our program change, which is the laptops, and these are to replace some of our desktop computers, which are really, really old. They were old even prior to COVID, and they were new to us from the, from the county. So we didn't even purchase them outright they were refurbished computers. We would like to start purchasing our own technology so we're not as beholden to the county, as well as making sure that we do have new up-to-date technology. A reason for laptops over desktops is habits have changed. People don't want to sit next to each other anymore. So laptops allow more flexibility for that. They can take them anywhere in the library. They can sit at the table. They can sit down in the children's area. They can sit at one of the desk study carols, they're not forced to sit only in one area like you are with laptop, like you are with desktops. Also, it allows for our classes. The laptops would be spread over all three branches, but we could bring them together if we are holding a class. So a class on Microsoft Office, how to use a computer, advanced applications for coding. A lot of libraries are offering coding classes. We have not had the technology to do that yet. And our makerspace, primarily our Cricut, those design space for the Cricut is required to run on a laptop or a desktop. And our Cricut space is really taking off this year. We're able to offer mugs, t-shirts, everything. And right now it's a one-on-one -on -one because we don't have the availability to offer more laptops to people, more computer access, so people can come on and learn how to design in a class. So that is the reason why we're presenting this program change. I did say we had two capital costs. And the first one is for our new Midhurst roof or repairs to Midhurst roof. I don't know if anybody has driven by it. It is beginning to look a little ragged in places. It is original to the building, which was built in 1988. I've been told that an average lifespan for this type of roof is around 30 years. And so that would be older than that at this moment. It is a township owned facility. So even though the library will be moving to the new community hub, it still is important to maintain the building, especially as 
we are going to be in it for a few more years. And we don't want to have lots of leaks. We haven't yet, cross our fingers, but please take a look. It's looking a little bit ragged. And then our envelope renovation. I know this is our large ask. It's 125,000 designed for 2023 for the renovation, which would include some community input. And then 2024 and 2025, you have much larger numbers, 1.1 million and 550,000 for the actual building, um, well, renovation of the building. This building does have some structural issues. This one does have a very leaky roof. Our, we have um, worn carpet and ripped carpet behind the circulation desk. We have problems with lighting. We have shelves breaking. Our uh, emergency exit railing is all rusted out. I invite everybody to come do a tour as well as it is not very accessible. We have a lift which requires two people to utilize, and it does not really allow for those mobility scooters that most people use nowadays. So they would not have access to our building because in order to get into our building, you must go up three steps. Also the story time pit, which you can sort of see a picture of up there, is a wonderful 1980s feature for a lot of libraries built at that time, but you cannot access any materials in the pit if you have any mob mobility issues whatsoever because you cannot get down those three stairs. So we would like to have the renovation also to address all these accessibility issues. We are supposed to be open to all and having barriers to access goes against that. Another thing is this library does not suit a modern library. Libraries nowadays have maker spaces, they have podcasting video creation stations, they have study rooms, they have flexibility. These are no longer nice to have, but in a modern library, they are now an actual necessity. People are coming into our branch looking for a quiet space. They're looking for an area to do a Zoom call. And we know internet is not good everywhere. If you need, sometimes if you need to do a private Zoom call, you need a private space. We cannot offer that. Students are looking for a place to do videos for their assignments and they're kicked out of school at 3.30. They do not have a space to do things like that. People now want a flexible space. So you can move some shelves out of the way and have a bigger, larger program or a larger meeting. And the way the Envelope Branch is, it really precludes us from doing any of that. It limits what we can offer to our residents. We are lucky in Springwater to be surrounded by some amazing libraries, many of whom have undergone a renovation or a new build. Then I can't wait to see the new Wasega Recreation Center and Library, which is supposed to be finished this fall. Barry just renovated Painswick and also has a new branch, Holly. Midland had a renovation several years ago, has an amazing makerspace, so I invite everybody to take a look at it. And of course, right next door, we have the new award-winning Stainer branch, which is an excellent demonstration of a smaller library. So staff have been able to go there, which has been great because Ontario libraries are really good at stealing ideas from each other. We call it sharing. They're always open. But in a way, it's also worked against us because our residents have seen these libraries too and then come in and want to know, why don't you have these? If these other libraries have it, why don't you? But we are able to get lots of inspiration. So it does save on staff time and ideas because we can just pull what we like and what will work for us. When we have new residents coming in, a comment we sometimes hear, and it, they don't know exactly how they mean it, but sometimes it doesn't sound quite positive, is, is this the library? Is this all it is? This is really cute. So, especially people coming from larger centers. Luckily, our staff make up for any lacking, that is in any less, anything that our facility actually lacks. So, the library, is more than just books. It's that community center, that lifelong learning, text hub, valued member of the community. And we still offer books, but now we offer books that you can actually read on your phone. The past few years have been ones of challenge, but staff have stretched out of the comfort zone. They've learned how to use new technology, offer virtual programs, deal with county changes, provincial changes. And this year we are really looking forward to being able to offer more to our community. 
more events, more programs, more technology, hopefully a better building. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present my estimates to you today. I humbly request that they are passed at the final approval of the budget. I can offer answer questions now. I also am available tomorrow for council drop-ins. I will be at the budget meeting Friday. I'm available next week if tomorrow doesn't work. Unfortunately, I can't be at the meeting on February 2nd. I'm gonna be at the Ontario Library Association helping to present a Lifetime Achievement Award to a colleague. So I'll make my excuses in advance for missing that session, but I am available to answer questions now and then later on. Thank you, CAO Delgado. And can I ask that you move the mics closer to your, oh. thank you, just as we go through this. May I have a mover and seconder to receive the presentation from Jody Player Delgado, CEO of the Springwater Public Library. Moved by Councillor Garwood, seconded by Deputy Cabral, that the presentation from the Springwater Public Library regarding the 2023 budget request be received and that the 2023 library operating budget request in the net amount of 964,486 be referred to the January 20th, 2023 budget session for further consideration. And at this point, Council, I will open the floor for any comments or questions. Councillor Garwood. Thank you, Mayor Coughlin. Throw yourself to uh, CEO Delgado. Um, I just had a question for you in regards to the capital asks. So I think about the business model of the library. Um, and again, you had opened, I believe, your presentation with why libraries. While I'm sure we all have our own opinion as to why the library is important to us or our communities, I know I've heard from quite a few residents in regards to the budget in relation to the library and future renovations plans, specifically for the Elmvale branch. So when I think of the business model of the library, I know a lot of businesses have had to change and adjust their model um, and how they move forward, especially throughout the pandemic. So how do you envision the library if this renovation was to move forward with this space that we have in Elmvale? How do you envision that space? Do you envision it as a multi-use space? Do you envision it additional programming? Because we know with the internet and Amazon, we can get our books at home, we can look online. The library, just as you mentioned, is so much more than just books. So what do you envision for the Elmvale Library or all Springwater Libraries? CEO Delgado. Thank you, Mayor Coughlin, and through you to Councillor Garwood. That is a very good question. I have lots of great ideas, and I know our outgoing board have lots of great ideas as well for that branch. I'm sure our new board will even add to those. And it is for this community hub where everybody can come in and feel welcome. By making it more flexible, we can do more with it. So we can have programs, we can hold meetings, we can have more opportunities for children uh, to our seniors. Those are both right now our children's programming and our creative adult programming are our most popular and we'll be able to do more because we'll have space that can be reconfigured what children need is very different from what adults need. And if we have a flexible space, we're not limited to half of the libraries for children only, and then this half is for adults, we'll be able to reconfigure it with movable shelves, lighter furniture, modular furniture, so we can bring it together, move it apart as needed. And that way we will be able to better serve all the residents. Also, for example, with the laptops, having more flexible technology, we know everything is, we went online, we were virtual online. So having aspects so we can help people do more online, hence the study rooms and podcasting or vi video areas for these maker spaces. Also having maker spaces so people can come in, show off their creativity, maybe jumpstart a couple of businesses, which is what happened with the maker space in Innisfil. So using that model and helping our business people and providing the area for them and resources. And ideally, it would be in both Elmville and the community hub. Elmville right now is our largest branch. So for today, that is the focus. But as we move into the community hub, we want to bring a lot of these ideas to that as well. Follow on. Thank you, Mayor Colgan, through yourself to uh... CEO Delgado. Um, in regards to the laptops specifically, um, just two quick notes I wanted to mention. The first one is, um, have you estimated a 
estimated total for loss over the life cycle of these laptops. I think of sto- you know laptops being stolen, dropped, broken, etc. If they are being loaned out and taken home or utilized throughout the community, and then the second part of that. Do you have a estimated life cycle of how long those devices would last? And then in the future, what that, again, expected investment would be? Um, Yes, thank you. CEO. Thank you, Mayor Coughlin. Through you again to Councillor Garwood. Right now, the laptops are for in-house use only. So we don't have to account for loss from being taken out. We do have a separate technology budget within our operating budget, which can cover the cost of one laptop or repairs during a year. It can't cover all of them, hence the actual program change on that one. I do hope to get five-year cycle for them. I know laptops can be three to five years. We do have county IT and they're not going to be used like a staff laptop, in which case it would be a three-year life cycle. With the public use on it, I'm hoping to have a five-year life cycle. Uh, And just as a follow-on to Councillor Garwood's question, when you were speaking about um, working with the county IT, understanding that 32 councillors had just returned 32 iPads. Was there any discussion with the county to utilize those for our libraries? No, there wasn't. I can bring that up at our next county meeting because I didn't realize those had been returned. The county is moving forward with their new Microsoft 365 schedule and they were happy to find out that I was potentially getting new laptops and that would be the start of their Microsoft 365 for all the licensing and basically being the pilot project for that. Thank you. Councillor Fisher? You're saying a five-year uh, five year estimated lifespan, but I'm noticing it's an annualized expense of $12,000. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to that. In addition to that, do you have an average cost and an overall number that you're looking to purchase? CEO Delgado? For the annualized, it is supposed to be only for this one year. It is a one-time purchase. So hence for the program change, I think it's annualized because it's not going to be that's a full account. Normally, they think they annualize, and Director Rowdy can, can um, correct me, but for staffing purposes, we use the same form. And I'm sorry, I'm, the other part. Councillor Fisher? Um, number of units and average yeah. cost. We're, thank you, Mayor Coughlin, and through you to Councillor Fisher. We're hoping for an average of $1,000 per laptop. We don't need the high end model. So, I know there's gaming laptops and all that go out 1500 2000 we will be working with county to say this is what we have this is what our needs are what can you find us and usually they provide dells lenovo's so the higher end ones that are will hold up more and then they will give us a number a couple of options we will choose that so we're looking about 10 to 12 depending on what options they give us and then they'll be divided them at six for example if we got 12 Six at Elmville, four at Midhurst, two at Minnesin. And then we can bring them together for classes as needed. And I can move along to another member, Deputy Cabral. Thank you, uh, Mayor Coughlin. Um, a few questions. I, I guess right away I'm thinking about the, uh, the, uh, the build ask, really. And I'm thinking to myself, from what you've said, uh, CEO Delgado, uh, we're talking about shelving that's broken. We're talking about carpets that war- are, is worn. Um, we're, we're talking about it looking a little old. And, and, and I get that, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that's an awfully large amount of money when really what we're talking about is refurbishing what's already there. Um, uh, also, there's limited floor space, uh, which presents in and of itself some difficulty in trying to put into place all the things that you're envisioning. And although they all sound great, um, there's, a, there's a conflict between people wanting to go there and read and have a quiet spot and then sitting next door right to them is going to be someone doing a, a Zoom meeting. Um, there's more appropriate places for that to happen, especially if they're bringing in their own Uh, laptop or whatever to do that and so I'm trying to picture how all this is going to work together and to Councillor Garwood's uh, point with respect to the laptops one of my first concerns would be well you know is it going to walk out the door 
my preference would be that they're not mobile because then you're going to have to have additional outlets for plugging them in that uh, if you want to uh, give folks space would be to have several locations where you could have these laptops affixed to the table. Uh, certainly, you wouldn't want anybody to introduce any malicious code into them. And if they're handling them and moving them around, they're not going to last as long as they might if they're, you know, pretty well in a fixed position. I certainly understand the desire to replace the the uh, tabletops are there, but I would also question whether or not thousand dollars is appropriate um, spend for laptops when if we're going to be surfing the internet and we're going to be printing. I'm not a big fan of gaming at the library, to be quite honest with you. I think that would be a big, uh, 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 a big demand on our broadband that you have at the library. If you had a bunch of uh, people playing, uh, um, uh, you know, games online. However, I would suggest maybe something that might be a little bit more appropriate would be maybe a Chromebook and you could buy several of those, like probably three times the number and for that kind of money. So that would be some of my concerns. So um, I just kind of like throwing these things out there to say that it's it's not that you don't want to see it changed, even when it comes to the pit and we're talking about accessibility. Well, the easy solution for me would be to fill in the pit, you know, and put carpet over top of it. Uh, however, I know that there's uh, space downstairs that might be utilized for some of the other uh, aspects um, that you're envisioning, you know, like the uh, the digital uh, uh, video uh, kind of a suite that uh, Innisfil has. However, I'm also mindful that Innisfil has a substantially larger uh, tax base than, than we do, and they also have pretty well about twice the population now, and that is a relatively new facility there, but I have to admit, I was impressed when I did go there for the tour. So these would be my concerns going forward. I think it's only fair that you, uh, you kind of know that that's kind of where I'm sitting. Um, as far as the library in Minnesing goes, uh, I'm kind of wondering if, and I'll have to reach out to CAO Schmidt on this uh, from a facility standpoint, if, if those roof has been there since 1990, that'd be about 30 years. That's about the longest warranty you're going to get on a shingle nowadays anyway. And I could see from the picture that they're curled up, uh, forget the leaves. I'm just wondering, is that not something that would normally fall into what township would be looking after rather than having that ask come from the library specifically? Thank you. CEO Schmidt. Thank you, Mayor Cogman. Let's read you to Deputy Mayor Cabral. So Deputy Mayor Cabral, uh, you are correct. It is a township owned facility and it is something that would typically come through uh, the township's uh, facility department. I believe there has been some conversation between uh, Ms. Delgado as well as uh, township staff. Um, and I believe this was also identified, although I'd have to maybe um, um, seek uh, General Ramdale's, General Manager Ramdale's uh, concurrence on this. I believe this was identified in the facility assessment uh, review. Uh, I believe it was within the next uh, one to five years that the, that the roof should be considered to be um, replaced, if you will. Um, so um, it is, I believe, coming through, I, I stand to be corrected as to how it's being funded. I believe it's being funded through taxation. So uh, whether it's through taxation that's provided to the library or taxation that's provided to uh, uh, the township, it, it's the same tax dollar, I guess, is, if you will. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, CAL Delgado, if you wanted to comment on Council, or sorry, Deputy Cabral's. Yes, thank you, Mayor Cogman, and through you to Deputy Mayor Cabral. You bring up a lot of good issues. The Chromebook versus laptop one is one that we did look at. We looked at Chromebooks first. We have our outgoing board had several school teachers, and so they are very familiar with the Chromebooks. We do have a security system on our desktops that would be able to be switched over to the laptop. So you have to sign in with a library card to use them. So that would help mitigate against some loss. Also, it erases everything. So once you turn it off, so people, anything, viruses, et cetera, it basically keeps those out. So that helps with the security thing. When we were looking at the Chromebooks, because it's a very good point, they're much cheaper, we could get more of them. Unfortunately, for the classes we've been asked, like how to use Microsoft Office, they won't work. Our security system, I've heard both good things. Oh, yes, it works in Chromebooks. It doesn't work on Chromebooks. County IT was like, me. So I really am very leery about trying it on Chromebooks and not sure if it'll work. 
And we do know that our Cricut design software, which is our major makerspace project at the moment, will not work on Chromebooks. It needs the Microsoft Operating Center, not the Google Chrome operating. So that was going back and forth on that one, which is why we ended up settling on laptops. And it was a very large, long discussion at our board and among staff. As for the space use, I realize this is a big ask. It is combination of the structural upkeep, so the roof, windows, flooring, painting, things like that, new shelving. We have received some new furniture, which we purchased from a grant, which with the idea of it working with anything that comes in to do a renovation. So we're not going to be buying new things and getting it out. It's going to be there and keeping it there. However, the renovation is based upon the recommendations from our master plan in 2019, and they identified some areas that we can make better use of the space. So instead of, like, and one of the things was our lift because it's not accessible. When that building was built and that lift went in due to the water table at the facility, it, they couldn't do a proper elevator because the elevator mechanisms were at the bottom and it would be affected by, there's an artesian flow on that corner. Now you can do an actual elevator at the top. So if you reconfigure the entrance, you can actually move the circulation desk to there, have a larger, use that space that is used for that front, basically that front stairway. So reconfigure that, you get a little bit of space from there. Reconfigure the other stairwell, the main one that leads downstairs from the center of the library, make open it up a little bit, bring more light downstairs, reconfigure the downstairs, we could have actual quiet study rooms. So rooms that have glass panels, similar to our council here, where you can open it up and be part of the library, close it when you need the prov your private Zoom call or your quiet study room for tutoring. So that is why the ask is more than just a journal replace, refresh of the furniture and some of the structural needs like the new roof. It's because it's some actual structural changes to make the facility more modern, more flexible and allow multiple uses. So it is in the master plan. So I can um, shoot you some of those ideas that were in the master plan if you'd like me to, or you can come in and I can show you. It's really cool. I know that was from 2019, so things will have changed. Even by now, we won't be getting everything, but it's a really great idea and vision to work towards. I did say I would go to Councillor Fisher next and then Councillor Thompson. Uh, through you, Mayor, to CEO Delgado. I've uh, I've read both uh, building condition reports for both the Elmvale and Midhurst libraries, both of them from April of 2022, so they are quite up to date. Uh, I tell you, the question I have to ask, you know, we're asking for nearly $1.8 million to update the Elmvale Library. Replacement cost on the building is only 2.7, valued at 350 a square foot. You know, um, <clears throat> are we, in your estimation, smart to be putting this type of money into that building and also refinishing the roof at $25,000 on the Midhurst Library when in the not too distant future, we very well could be um, moving it to the, the new hub? Is this, uh, again, in your estimation, is this money well spent on a building that, uh, it, to quote yourself, is, um, uh, is not a modern library? Councillor Fisher, I'm going to direct that to CEO Schmidt okay. and then back to CEO Delgado for further comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Coughlin. Through you to uh, Councillor Fisher. Councillor Fisher, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the, the Midhurst Library specifically as for the the Elmville Library, it might be a, a bigger conversation. So I'll tackle Midhurst first. I think you're correct. The idea is, is that uh, the Midhurst Library, uh, subject to council's approval, uh, will be moving to uh, the community hub. Uh, that said, assuming that happens, uh, that facility is still going to be, or right now is still going to be a township facility. There has been no discussion and or, and or direction from council to staff as to what the long-term um, um, operation of that facility will be. So I think it is a township uh, facility. We ought to uh, continue to invest in the facility. Uh, and again, if in the next three to five years, it's decided that 
the township is, is declaring a surplus and we get rid of it, fine, and or we, we look at repurposing it for other reasons uh, or other um, operations for the township. And again, that discussion still needs to happen with council. Um, as for, like I said, the Elmville Library, um, uh, that is a much bigger conversation that I think council ought to have. Um, I'm sure as CEO Delgado mentioned, you know, there is a master plan, uh, likely that information uh, should be uh, um, reviewed by council and understood what the what the recommendations of that master plan were to ensure that uh, you have a firm understanding as to uh, what's being proposed. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. CEO Delgado. Thank you, Mayor Coughlin, and through you to Councillor Fisher. I agree with CAO Schmidt's comments on the Midhurst roof. We, it is going to be several years before we do move into the new building. So it behooves us to take care of that facility now before it does become a larger issue and then becomes more expensive. That's my opinion. And I know other facilities experts will be able to give you further details on that. As for Elmville, we are in a really, really good location right now where that branch is. It is the anchor tenant, one of the anchor tenants for the main street. It is accessible to everybody from anywhere in town as much as I would love a new branch library, eventually for Elmville too, if we're going to be getting the community hub in the South End, it'd be great to get something for the North End. I don't foresee that happening. There may be information in the background on that that I don't know that may come into play later on, but it is a great location. So it would be great to take care of it, make it a more modern facility, make it even more inviting, and then really benefit all of our residents there. Councillor Thompson and then Councillor Garwood. Uh, through Mayor Coughlin to CEO Delgado, just a couple of questions. One is, or, and one comment, my idea about roofing is to repair the roof before it starts leaking. Um, I visited the Elmville Library for the first time last week and noticed two easily identifiable roof, identifiable roof leaks. Um, <clears throat> has there been any plan to get those fixed or is that or are we just waiting for the renovation? That's the first question. Second question is with regards to the laptops, do any of our neighboring libraries like the Stainer Library have a laptop program? And how is that working for them? CEO Delgado. Thank you, Mayor Coughlin, and through you to Councillor Thompson. Um, as for the mid, um, the Elmbo roof leaks, they have been patched multiple times. I think it is mentioned in the facility assessment that that roof is due for a new roof as well. I'm not sure what the timing on that would be if we don't go forward with this renovation at the moment. We are hoping to actually fix the uh, drywall in branch on that, but that still doesn't, I don't even know if there's anything up in the ceiling at this point. So it's more like the Band-Aid solution, unfortunately, for the moment until we get more direction to move forward on that one. As for the laptops, I'm not sure about Stainer. I know many libraries do have laptops. And actually, one of my ideas that I got was from Barry Holly Branch, where they have actual a 3D printed holder for the laptops at their, they don't have a full circulation desk at that branch, but they have this area in the middle and they have the laptops available on this holder. And then people take them from the holder and bring them back. So I reached out to Barry to say, if we get the laptops, can we steal your specs for the 3D printed holder to make it even cheaper to do? And then because we have the security on the system, we get we know when people are checking them in and out because they have to go through our center administration console and have their library cut. So it's a very easy, low tech way to provide higher technology. Councilor Garwood. Thank you, Mayor Coughlin. Through yourself to CEO Delgado. Um, in regards to the accessibility of the Elmville branch, um, I know you had mentioned, you know, the library accessible to everybody. When I think of a library, I think of a welcoming space, a safe space, et cetera. But as we know, um, facilities need to meet AODA requirements by 2025. So is a large portion of the renovation and update to the Elmville Library, as was mentioned, I think earlier on in regards to moving the elevator or allowing for that, regardless whether a renovation moves forward, the accessibility issue will need to be rectified. Is that correct? 
CEO Delgado. Through you, Mayor Coughlin, to Councillor Garwood, I'm not sure about the status of existing buildings because when that was built, it did meet the accessibility requirements at that time. So I may have to defer part of my answer and I stand to be corrected if this information is not correct. To the best of my knowledge, we are okay currently moving forward, but if any work is done on that facility, then we would need to be upgraded to the AODA com components. And um, Director Radigan or CAO Schmidt can correct me if it is not what I just said. I'm, I'm actually gonna defer to Clerk Ainsworth for clarification. Okay. Uh, thank you, no, uh, Jody is correct. So unless renovations happen, major renovations, um, the building does not automatically have to be brought up to AODA standards. And thank you, Kirk Ainsworth. And as a follow on to that understanding that AODA, those standards, if we do move forward with this renovation, would we be opening ourselves up to having those standards? Would there be additional costs uh, that we may not be mindful of at this point? Sorry, Kirk Ainsworth. Ah, uh, thank you, through you. Um, it, it really depends. It would be based on this first step. The consultant would be required to identify anything that would be required to bring the building up to the AODA standards. Thank you, Clerk Ainsworth. And Deputy Cabral, and then Cal Councillor Alexander. Thank you very much, Mayor Coughlin. Um, I guess a comment followed by a question. Um, uh, you were talking about uh, the county uh, pretty well administering, you know, uh, the inf not the infrastructure, but your internet and your connectivity. Um, and I, I just have to ask the question. I don't understand, I guess, why laptops that should be not really part of our network that are being used by the public in the library uh, would require any different um, safeguards when connecting to the network wirelessly than the folks who are sitting in the street across in the parking lot using their own personal devices. And the only reason I bring this up is, I mean, we have a firewall in place, but it also plays into the costs associated with certain Microsoft Office products. Uh, if these are standalone laptops, I'm just curious if um, if you're aware of a product called Open Office by Apache, which many, I'm wondering if that might be uh, a possibility for those folks that want to come in and work on spreadsheets, work on uh, presentations, work on documents. And I do realize that educationally, Microsoft does provide preferential pricing. But given the number of laptops that we might be talking about, I'm wondering if that's something that you may have already considered and something that maybe uh, might be put into place to offset some cost. Uh, thank you. And for you, um, for the comments, I don't know if we have uh, IT Bernie on that might be able to provide some insights to council or if see, oh, and he's on. Mm -hmm. Sorry to put you on the spot there. Go ahead. That's okay. Uh, thank you. Uh... Uh, sorry, Mayor, Mayor Coughlin to uh, Deputy Mayor Cabral. Um, certainly, uh, there are, because we're using, or because we have multiple people using the laptops and things like that, having it automatically refresh, definitely a good idea. You don't know what the last person put on there for sure. Um, and on top of that, you know, we have safeguards in place, but it, you can never be too careful, as you know, that, that'll probably be a common theme when anytime we talk about security, right? You want defense in depth. So any sort of uh, security measures is definitely a good measure. Um, as for open office, um, certainly I would use that, you know, personally and stuff like that, especially definitely uh, some cost savings there. There are a lot of benefits using Microsoft products, um, just in like Microsoft's, you know, the, the leader in terms of, uh, integration basically that's that's kind of why everything talks together um you know it, most people use word most people use excel they're familiar with those things sure, the layout's similar but um just the interoperability of all those applications is definitely a benefit um and I'm trying to think of uh sorry did that uh, um, acknowledge some of your questions there <laughs> sorry just a bit on the spot Deputy Cabral, and I do apologize again, Coordinator Bernie. 
Um, no, that, thank you. And, and I certainly agree that the refresh would be critical. Um, I mean, that's a given. Uh, people are going to be using it. You know, you want it to refresh itself and, and get rid of all the previous uh, data that's on it. But I mean, that's just part and partial to whatever happens to be on that particular uh, device. Uh, I, I guess I guess what it boils down to is uh, Microsoft Office does have its uh, its perks, obviously. However, we're in a library setting where chances are if they're using a library laptop, they don't have that kind of connectivity where they're trying to keep their work laptop and their personal device and all this stuff all synced up. Um, so I, that's why I brought it up. And uh, I've been using uh, the other one for a number of years. I guess I'm a holdout, don't want to give my money to Microsoft if I don't have to. Uh, but if you're running uh, uh, a lot of the stuff on the internet, you can still sync up all your devices without having uh, to worry about Microsoft. There's ways to do it that way too. So I just brought it up as kind of a, a thought on cost savings, you know, thank you. Thank you. And, and as a follow on to Deputy Cabral's comment there, uh, not, we have lots of tech experts here. I am not one of those, but I do understand that um, most schools are using the Chromebooks and I would I would assume that they would take on some sort of or some level of protection um, software wise and is there a reason why all the laptops I would have to be the same if we need um, ones that are that will work with Word and Excel and the Cricut if there was a couple in those branches I mean there is no Cricut in the menacing branch to my knowledge so would there be an opportunity or what's the downside to having some Chromebooks, which our youth in Elmville are very familiar with, because I do believe both public schools um, have the same type of Chromebook. Um, so I, I'm just curious, is there a reason why all the laptops need to be of the highest end? To you, Mayor Coughlin, they don't need to be like the high end laptops. We probably should have a couple that are capable of doing Adobe, potentially for like the high school students who are doing that. An example is my daughter who was perfectly happy with her Chromebook. Now she's in high school. They do a lot more using Microsoft. So she uses our own laptop at home now for most of her schoolwork. But that is for the high school students. We, the reason we are using, we did recommend the laptops with Microsoft 365 is because that was what the county suggested. And as they run our IT, everything standardized makes it easier for them. We get things back in a more timely manner. And they're paying the licensing for Microsoft 365. That's part of the new Simcoe County Digital Library Service to standardize libraries across the county. I mean, if we get more money, we could definitely buy more <laughs> Chromebooks. Thank you. Councillor Alexander, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Coughlin. Um, I actually have a two-part question now that we've gone down the line, <laughs> um, just um, with respect to kind of the laptops, uh, the Chromebooks, as Mayor Coughlin was speaking about, um, understanding that um, your daughter is also in high school, and that's great that she's using the Adobe program. <clears throat> Both of my children who are also at Elmville High School use nothing Microsoft. They actually don't know how, which frustrates me, um, because all of their work is done on a Chromebook on a Chromebook, it's all Google Classroom based. So I do think if we are looking at that student population, um, we need to keep both in mind because I do think if we're gonna offer them, then as Mayor Coughlin said at the elementary school level, I believe it's mainly Chromebook and it is um, a lot of the high school as well, probably unless you're in more of a arts type <laughs> program, which at that point, if we had the laptops, they could utilize as well. So that's just a comment. I don't know if you have a comment back on that or CEO Delgado. If, I mean, depending on what we get from the county, oh, sorry, through you, Mayor Coughlin to Councillor Alexander, I mean, potentially we could decrease the number of laptops and add some Chromebooks to that as well. So that number is flexible in what we get. So if the will of council is to spend more money for Chromebooks, we could decrease them. We do need to keep a number of six for, that's a really good number, six to eight is a good number for classes, also for coding because you don't want to have only like four people coming in being able to code, you know, children like to work in larger groups stuff. But we could add some Chromebooks and decrease a couple of the laptops if necessary. Thank you. And back to Councillor Alexander. Uh, thank you, CAO DeGaldo. Uh, through you, Mayor Coughlin, to uh, Clerk Ainsworth, I believe, on the AODA standards. 
So with respect to the current setup in the Elmo Library, if I'm correct, um, there is the stair lift that takes you upstairs, um, nothing to go to the basement. So, oh, it does? Oh, okay, well that kind of partial my question. Um, so if it is currently accessible through both, um, I understand if we're looking at someone arriving on a scooter or something like that, it makes it more difficult. But if you're going to the upstairs, could we not just utilize a ramp system, which was much more cost effective than putting in a whole new stair lift? And I don't know if that would meet our standards from an AODO perspective. And I actually don't know how I'm not familiar with these standards, um, but how much someone on a scooter falls into that accessibility. Because in general, if you are on a scooter, you do have the ability to walk once you get off of it. It's not like someone in a power chair or a wheelchair that has no mobility. Thank you. And I will go to Clerk Ainsworth first and then back to CEO Delgado. Uh, thank you. I'm not that familiar with it. I'm not too sure if the deputy clerk is uh, has a bit more knowledge on that, um, the, the specifics of the types of accessibility to a building is, is something that's um, outside of my realm of expertise. Deputy Clerk Marshall. Thank you through Mayor Coughlin to Councillor Alexander. Um, so depending on the renovations planned, um, some of the AODA requirements actually do fall under the building code, which I am not so familiar with. Uh, but I do know if we were to plan for uh, putting in a ramp, uh, there are um, in the standards, uh, we would have to pay attention to the um, slope and, and that type of thing. Um, so it would, I'm not uh, certain that the requirement is to provide a lift. I think that if a ramp um, is installed and planned for that, that would be acceptable. And back to CEO Delgado. Thank you, Mayor Coughlin, and through you to Councillor Alexander. When the building first opened, there was a ramp and it actually had a different entrance. The entrance were those doors onto Maria Street and the ramp proved to be too steep at that time. So then they reworked the entrance way to have the stairs up, the stairs down at that area, and then the lift. So the lift is very narrow. It is hard to maneuver and you do need somebody to hold the door which is why we say it's partially accessible because it is a two person. So somebody coming in on their own could not do it by themselves, which goes against the principles of accessibility and being independent. But there are probably ways to do it. You would just need to completely reconfigure that front entrance way. Councillor Fisher and then Garwood. Uh, through you, Mayor, to CEO Delgado. Uh, my question actually uh, has to do with the carry forward from last year, uh, the library courier van for $50,000. Uh, I remember this being talked about last year, and uh, you know, I've always questioned uh, how useful it is. I was wondering if you could take counsel, um, this council, through why you feel you need it and uh, what benefit it would actually serve. CEO Delgado. Thank you, Mayor Coughlin, and through you to Councillor Fisher. The courier van was approved last year. We do, Council does need to decide on the type of purchase, whether it's a purchase or a lease. And the reason we put that forward was because right now our weekly courier, which is two times a week to move materials between all three branches, is done in a personal vehicle, which is a liability issue. Also, the a personal vehicle precludes us from doing more outreach events, putting a tent into it, having um, like tables, books, sort of a pop-up library going many places forward. Prior to COVID, when we were out a lot, I did some, I don't have the full figures in front of me, but I can get them to you, where we would have been using that van like four days a week, and if not five days a week in the summer months to go to events for the courier. It would also be used for trading and meetings. So instead of people taking like multiple cars and then paying mileage, we would take the van because I preferred the passenger version of the van so we could fit more people in it and then remove those back seats as needed. It was supposed to come back to council. We had it on for the agenda twice. It got pulled. I was off on medical leave in the summer, so wasn't able to bring it forward at that time. And then in September, it was, I was waiting for 2023 numbers and it was advised to be to wait for the numbers and also wait until after everything for the election. So 
I've now been waiting for Public Works. They've gotten back to me, and their numbers are the same as what I have, so it will be coming forward shortly. Okay. And I will go to Councillor Garwood and then Deputy Mayor Carroll. Thank you, Mayor Coughlin. Through yourself to CEO Delgado. Um, I have a two-pronged question. Both are staffing related. Um, so going back to our popular topic of laptops tonight or today, um, in regards to increasing technology in the library space, um, I believe obviously that the space needs to be multi-used and we do need to progress and we do need to utilize things like technology, which is so important in uh, everyday life. But as we increase technology, we purchase laptops, we purchase different items for programming and whatnot. Does that require a down the road, additional staffing, additional staff training? That's my first part of my question. And the second part is off uh, what Councillor Fisher had just mentioned in regards to the van. If we are increasing the movement of books or whatnot throughout the municipality at the three different branches. Again, does that increase staffing requirement and expenses because that van's then on the road multiple days a week, taking folks away from the physical branch locations? Sorry for the long question. <laughs> okay, CEO Delgado. Thank you, Mayor Coughlin, and through you to Councillor Garwood, and hopefully I remember both parts of your question. Um, first off, staffing for tech. As the library does get more technology, we will need more training. Staff have been working on training um, through the last few years. Obviously, as we went to our virtual branch, that has been greatly increased. And luckily, with the increase in the virtual branch, we've also increased the number of training opportunities available to us virtually. Our OLA conference, for example, is now available as a hybrid. So I have some staff attending in person, some staff attending the virtual component. So that has actually worked out in tandem very well. And then you will see for 2024, we will be presenting a program change for additional staff at that time called their Emerging Technologies Librarian, which is a position many libraries have been adding in to add for the makerspace. So with the renovation, with the new community hub coming, we will be getting these makerspaces. We will be having the podcast video creation stations. And then they will be the one in charge of training staff, as well as man monitoring, managing, keeping up on all this new technology and presenting programs to our patrons so they can also make use of it. So instead of having all the staff be required to know everything, which means like sort of jack of all trades, master of none, right? We would have at that point one staff member. And so that would actually be better and more efficient for our staff time if we have one point person for that, and then they can work with our programmers for what they need to know. So that'll be moving forward. It's still for next year and something to work up towards. And then for the courier van, having the courier van is actually beneficial because we're not paying out in mileage for our staff's time, right, for their own cars. So anything we are currently paying out in mileage because we pay out in mileage as our staff members using their own car right now. When we travel outside of the township for trainings, we reimburse for mileage. If it's within the township, we don't. That is considered part of their duties. But when they're traveling out, or we do have staff that go from one branch to another and so during the course of the day, so that could help ease that. And it's just more efficient, better liability, and in a way too, as well, better branding. When people see a courier van, they know the library is out in the middle of the community. Midland has a van. We went to a joint program where Midland, Penetang, and Springwater libraries were. First thing my kids were like, Midland Library is here. They didn't care about Springwater Library. They just wanted to go see Midland Library because Midland had a fancy van. So it also increases visibility and in basically makes us look more professional as well, which it does have a trickle down effect. So there are many benefits to having that. Thank you. And before I do go to Councillor Cabral, sorry, Deputy Mayor Cabral, I did want to be mindful that uh, we are approaching our four o'clock timeline on our agenda. I do see that our next presenters are here. I am no way suggesting that we need to move on to that. But if Council would be mindful of that, we can let the presenters know that we will be late or if we're moving along through. I'll move to Councillor sorry, to Deputy Cabral and then Councillor Fisher. And I do see Councillor Moore has popped back on. Thank you, uh, 
Mayor Coughlin. Um, actually, two quick questions, and one of them you'll uh, hopefully provide an explanation, actually, on both of them. The first one, I'm going to step right back to the very beginning where we were talking about digital uh, books, and there was an increased cost. Uh, I'm just kind of sitting here thinking that we have a physical copy. Only one person can take that physical copy out. I'm envisioning the digital license. Numerous people could, no, it's still only the one digital license per book. So you could go on there, and it would say, sorry, uh, that that digital book's already been borrowed. It depends on the license that you get. Okay, that, okay, that answers that question. The second one is we're talking about the makerspace, and I don't know about everybody else, but I know what you're talking about um, from being down in this uh, and it's more than just the cricket. It's more than that. Could you kind of um, just maybe uh, advise council members who might not know what makerspace is being used, the term, and, and what it actually does involve? CEO Delgado. Thank you, Mayor Coughlin, and through you to Deputy Mayor Cabral. Um, many libraries now have what they term a makerspace, and it is different in each library because it depends on what your community needs. So, for example, Innisville is the epitome of makerspaces, and they have everything, which is honestly a lot. They have a laser cutter, they have crickets, they have 3D printers, they have a music station where you can create your own music with the full soundboard. They have a video station with the full green screen and you can do all these cool effects. We don't need all of that. Our patrons are not asking for all of that. Um, Midland has one where they have the laser cutter, uh, several crickets, 3D printers, sewing machines, which is funnily enough, we have a sewing machine to lend out. So that's how we've been getting around not having an actual makerspace. But we do have people who want to learn how to use it, for example. So it's all these things basically anything to where you can create. Innisfil also has a whole scanning station where you can take old cassette tapes or like old video cassette tapes and scan them to digital. There are also other programs for that. I actually am not familiar very much with Barry's in their main branch, but they have a makerspace, makerspace there too. So when we talk about makerspaces, obviously spring waters would be much smaller, tailored to what our residents are asking for. And that would be more of a very small green screen area of any, the green screen area could also double for like podcasting. So making better use of the space. Our crickets, we have a space set up in Midhurst. We're trying to make more of a space in Elmba right now and trying to reconfigure everything for a sort of temporary space. We also have a scanner for documents and pictures in Elmba. And, but the cricket is really taking off and that's all we really have at the moment. And that's what our patrons are really asking us for, but they're asking, we have been hearing requests as well for like video production and green screen things. So that's where we're moving, but we would have a much smaller one, nothing like uh, Innisville, but I can take you to visit Innisville if you want. Thank you, Councillor Fisher. Uh, more of a statement than uh, than a question, uh, Mayor. Um, when I take a look at, uh, not to belabor the point, but uh, the renovations on both buildings, I, I, I have to question out loud, are we better, particularly when it comes to things like the AODA standards and the uh, potential in the next three, four, five years to be housing at least one facility in the hub, would it be smart to uh, maybe do the minimum requirements, uh, fixing roofs, uh, mitigating water damage? I know uh, I'll share this with you. Uh, Skylight in the Elmvale uh, branch, which is... Uh, they're asking uh, there's going to be water damage there. Uh, also a downspout outside and it's uh, uh, it's rated high. It should be done right now. Should we, and I'm asking council, should we maybe be looking at doing those repairs to um, you know mitigate any damage to a municipal asset and then put off any larger renovations, knowing the lay of the land in the future, again, with AODA standards and where a potential branch may end up? I'm just asking out loud you know, making a statement. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments for CEO Delgado while we have her with us here? Thank you. And CEO Delgado, to confirm you are here on Friday and then not on the following, on the second. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And at this point, I will call for the vote. All those in favor? And that has carried. And there is a second motion for the library. And that, uh, sorry, and then I would also need a mover and a seconder for the uh, program change PC 13. Library laptops be referred to the January 20th, 2023 budget session for further consideration. 
a mover and seconder, please. Councillor Moore and Thompson, and all those in favor. And that too has carried. Thank you. And we will take a brief moment. And there, look at that, already here. <laughs> Welcome. And at this point, I will call on Kareen Maxwell, Interim Physician Recruitment Coordinator, and Dr. Stuart Monarch to pre make their presentation. And I do have two members of council that are just going to sneak out real quick. So if we can just take a minute here. Thank you. My apologies, Councillor Moore, I was not using my mic there. I said we do have quorum. Um, however, I was just going to wait another minute for other members to return from getting, grabbing themselves a coffee. No, no, that's okay. Hi, Corrine. Hi, Dr. Murdoch. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And please do begin it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Corrine Maxwell, and I'm the Physician Recruitment Coordinator for the Barrie Area Physician Recruitment. As a lifelong Innisfil and Barrie resident and working in healthcare for the last 23 years, having enough family physicians and specialty physicians in our community is very important to me. Joining me today is Dr. Stuart Murdoch. He's the academic chief at the Barry Family Medicine Teaching Unit and co-chair at the Badberg Task Force. In the following presentation, both Dr. Murdoch and I will provide an overview of what Barry Area Physician Recruitment, otherwise known as BAPR, is, and some of our recent successes. Next slide, please. And we'll just go to the next slide. Thank you. So what is BAPR and who funds it? The purpose of the Barry Area Physician Recruitment Task Force is to bring physicians, healthcare leaders, community leaders, and municipal leaders together to develop and implement strategies to retain and recruit physicians for our community. Using these strategies, the recruitment coordinator works on rec recruiting and retaining both family medicine physicians and specialty physicians. Our funding partners include the Township of Springwater, the Township of Warren Medante, the Town of Innisfil, City of Barrie, and Rural Victoria Regional Health Centre. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, the province is facing a crisis with a current doctor shortage following the pandemic, specifically in family medicine. There are currently 1.8 million people living in Ontario without a family, med family physician. And according to our calculations, we have approximately 93,000 unattached patients within the Barrie area, which includes Springwater, or Medante, and Innisfil Township. Next slide. Some of the factors that are impacting the shortage include the challenging effects of COVID-19 on our healthcare workers. Many of our physicians have experienced burnout, fatigue, financial strain, and loss, lack of job satisfaction. Next slide. Aging population has a profound impact on primary care. As the patient population is aging, people are presenting with many more chronic diseases. 
The physician workforce is aging. Sir, seniors make up the fastest growing share of family doctors with the percentage 65 years and older, more than doubling to 15% from the 6.5% over the last 20 years. 1.7 million Ontario residents have a family doctor that is 65 years or older. Okay, and we can stay on this slide. I'm gonna pass it over to you, Dr. Murdoch. Okay, so we can move that. We'll go to the next slide. Oh, okay. okay. Good. Sorry, please skip ahead. And one more. There, there we go. go. Thank you. So one of my roles is I'm the uh, program director for uh, Department of Family and Community Medicine um, at the University of Toronto. <clears throat> and we've had a significant dwindling interest over the last five years in uh, primary care physicians that will set up comprehensive care uh, practices. And we have lots of different reasons for that. But last year we had uh, over 200 spots nationally that went unmatched after the first round of residency match into family medicine. Um, our rural college specialty, uh, like surgeons and pediatricians and 100% matched after the first round. And so we have a huge number and it's, it's, it's increasing. We know that 25% of people that match to family medicine in the first round choose it as its second choice, but they, they, they didn't get a Royal College position, but they got family medicine. So dwindling interest, uh, dwindling match and dwindling interest, lots of different reasons in um, the College of Family Physicians, the academic departments are certainly working on this and we can have a conversation, but the point is primary care interest, which means setting up your own family practice and all the issues you know about that is decreasing quickly. Uh, next slide. Um, and one of the things that many of our family physician graduates are doing, they're looking at an enhanced skill. So the interest in enhanced skill and enhanced skill is basically a family medicine graduate that will look in a subspecialty area of medicine, like emergency medicine, palliative care, care of the elderly, but choosing not to do primary care. Now, these are really important areas of medicine that we need. There's limited number of spots. We know 50% of people when they start their family medicine residency choose or think they're going to apply. But in the end, uh, it, it is about 20% that get this. Uh, so that pool of people that will set up family medicine uh, dwindles. Many of our uh, graduates will go into this uh, uh, area uh, of training. And so locally, what do we have in, with regards, next slide, please. Um, what do we have locally? So, we are fairly unique. We have one of the largest uh, family health organizations in the province. We are kind of what the government is actually trying to achieve across the province. And we talk about all this team-based care. We've created a lot of team-based care. And because of that, we've had significant success of recruitment compared to the rest of the province. Um, but it's still not enough and, and you're gonna hear why. So right now we have 104 family physicians that have their own roster of patients in the Barrie area. Um, and with that, they take care of just under 150,000 patients that are rostered. So if you add up all the population in our area, it leaves about 93,000 people without a local family physician. And unfortunately that number is going up. And our biggest problem is, is really uh, retirements. So our, our number of physicians has not increased, but we've been really good at uh, all the retirements. So over the last 10 years, every retiring physician, we've been able to find a replacement, except this year, and you know about one, but we've got four retiring physicians that we have not been able to find a replacement. Next slide. So um, for the good news, I'm going to speak about some of our successes over the past year. Um, so far in 2022-23, uh, we've successfully recruited 17 family physicians to our area, as, along with 41 new specialists to the hospital. Uh, some of the, oh, next slide, sorry. Some of the specialties that we have recruited are general internal medicine, anesthesiology, emergency physicians, uh, radiologist, endocrinologist, gastroenterologist, neurologist. Next slide. A general practitioner in oncology, pediatrician, vascular surgeon, plastic surgeon, orthopedic surgeon, surgical assistant, 
hospitalist and a gynecology oncologist. So recruitment of specialists such as these have helped out with the annual 206,000 imaging tests that we do um, each year that are read by our radiologists, the 82,000 emergency visits that the ED docs see, and the 10,000 surgeries that are completed by our anesthesiologists. So I'm sure we're all aware of the long wait list that we see to see a specialist such as these, but with the recent recruitment of these additional specialties to our community, we'll help our local residents get the care that they need, hopefully in a reduced wait time. Next slide. So we continue to recruit. Our area continues to grow and according to Census Canada, the population of spring water has increased by 14% since 2016. So listed up here, you can see a few of the other specialties that I'm continuing to recruit. Next slide. And I've listed here different ways that I do recruit. So we post advertisements on web pages, medical journals, social media. Um, I go through and I screen the applicants, I meet and greet interested applicants, build relationships with the candidates, arrange meet and greets interviews with our department chiefs and the Berry Family Health Team, uh, organize community tours, hospital tours and clinic tours. I act as a liaison between the community and the hospital and the Berry Family Health Team along with the FMTU. Um, I attend medical conferences. When I attend these, I set up a recruitment booth. I get a chance to meet with the different physicians that are coming through and try to attract them to our area. I maintain communication with each candidate and ensure all the appropriate follow-up is done with each of them. And I always try to act as an ambassador for our community, the hospital, and our family medicine teaching unit. Uh, next slide. And speaking of family medicine teaching unit, I'll let yeah, so one of our, our biggest successes is around our education program uh, for primary care. Um, and so we have residents in Barrie. And as you know, we uh, you have residents uh, practicing our training in, in Midland, who you'll hear later, as well as in Aurelia. So we have nine first-year residents in at the Barrie Family Medicine Teaching Unit and nine second-year residents. So we always have 18 residents. We graduate nine each year. Uh, Midland has two residents and Aurelia has, has two residents as well. Um, and so we do know if we bring them in our community, they live here for two years, they are in our communities, they're part of our professional staff, we retain a lot of them and our number is around 62%. Um, and with that, um, they, they become very active in our community, not just as primary care, next slide, but they also are part of the enhanced skill, and we talked about enhanced skill. So many of our graduates are hospitalists. They provide uh, palliative care, and they are uh, emergency physicians. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at in terms of our numbers. Uh, 117 are in, have been through our program, are in our program, and we're, we're retaining about 62%. Um, we are fairly sought after. So we have nine uh, family practice positions. Uh, I can tell you we had 480 applicants for next year's, uh, for starting July uh, 23. So well sought after program, uh, we always kind of fully match and do well. And so our future is strong on next slide. Um, we do know uh, if you train them, uh, they will stay. And there's our <clears throat> group that has come in from this, uh, that started this year, and they're all from all over the country. And I will add that we have two international medical graduates as part of our nine. So we have two Canadian medical graduates and two, sorry, seven Canadian medical graduates and two international medical graduates. There's lots of attention in the media around our IMGs. Um, and uh, there is expansion starting this year with our further expansion starting this year with our IMGs in Ontario, as well as across uh, Canada. We are anticipating in Ontario, or in, uh, with expansion, Ontario is going to be adding um, just over 100 new family medicine residency spots. U of T, which is our program, is adding 30 new spots with six starting this July and, and graduating up. So eventually U of T will have 200 first year uh, family medicine residents spread over 15 teaching sites and Barry being one of them. Okay, and if I can have our last slide. So the Barry Area Physician Recruitment kindly requests the financial support of $8,000 from the Township of Springwater to further our initiatives. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here and for your presentation. I will have a mover and seconder to have the presentation on the floor. Councillor Fisher and Moore. That the presentation from the Barrie and Area Physician Recruitment regarding the 2023 budget request be received and that the 2023 BARP budget request in the amount of $8,000 be referred to the January 20th, 2023 budget session for further consideration. And Council, at this time, is there any comment or questions? Councillor Alexander. Thank you, Mary Cog Mayor Coughlin. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. That was very interesting. So knowing that it is a different set, do you, when you are recruiting your family physicians to essentially set up office in Springwater, um, do we at all work with any type of nurse practitioner group to have them join them, just knowing that they can take away some of uh, their time essentially on lesser issues and then make that family doctor potentially see more people? I'm just wondering if there's any collaboration there. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> as part of our family health team, uh, it's a team, so it's team-based care. And within our team, we have nurse practitioners, we have diabetic educators, we have dietitians, we have lung health. So within the family health team, uh, we have uh, nurse practitioners. So in our teaching unit where our residents train, where I, where I work and see my practice, we have one nurse practitioner that is part of the team providing care. Um, it is obviously a, a, a budget thing. And because we're part of the family health team, we have that within the government budget. Um, but if you're not part of the family health team uh, um, and practicing solo, then there is no budget for that uh, to support a nurse practitioner. Um, some physicians are looking at the PA program and uh, there are 60 physician assistants that are graduated in Ontario every year, 30 at U of T and 30 at McMaster. Uh, the director of the PA programs, Dr. Galeski, who is in Midland, and there's lots of talk about expanding. But again, the big issue is uh, the funding models. Uh, we can train them, but where's the government going to put them and how are they going to work and, and pay? Many of the physician's assistants end up in the hospital, not in primary care, and they work part of a hospital team, maybe an orthopedics team, maybe a pediatric team, uh, and maybe a mental health team, and they work more on the wards and they work with uh, the specialists. Not a whole lot in primary care, partly because there's no funding model to support them. The physicians, if they want that, have they have to pay for that out of their their uh, funding. Thank you very much. And seeing no other comments or questions, Council, all in favor? And that has carried. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you much. again for joining us. At this point, I will call on uh, Dr. Jeff Koleski to make a presentation. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Council, for taking the time uh, uh, this afternoon. Um, I think uh, I sent the slide deck in. Is that uh, available? It'll just be a moment here while thank you. Okay, Marshall pulls good. it up. I'm sorry, I didn't know I was following the Barry group, so I will do my best to not duplicate <laughs> no uh, some of their messages. Um, uh, Stu, Dr. Merrick, and I work uh, uh, together at the university as well, so I we think we think alike. So I will do my best to make this efficient and not uh, repetitive for you. Great, and there we are. Please begin. Perfect. All right, thank you everyone. Again, I'm Jeff Galiski. I do family medicine and uh, emergency medicine uh, in Midland. Uh, I live in Penetanguishene and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. Um, I'm here representing Georgian Bay Physician Recruitment. Um, we support the municipalities of Midland, Penetanguishene, Tay, Tiny, Springwater as well. Um, we had a significant um, change in, in the way we uh, looked at recruitment about 12 months ago, and uh, I credit a lot of this uh, presentation, a lot of this work to our, our physician recruiter, uh, Shannon Lorne. Um, unfortunately, she uh, 
had an exciting opportunity with Ontario Health, and uh, so she has moved on, and we're actively recruiting a new recruiter for our hospital. So we're doing interviews, and I should have someone to, to support me going forward, but I'm here on my own today. Um, next slide, please. Our, our vision, um, together promoting healthy communities by recruiting and retaining highly skilled physicians that are integrated into both Georgian Bay Hospital and the surrounding communities. And the togetherness, I think, is sort of the theme of my, my presentation, our, our vision. Um, in, in communities of our size, whether it's whether it's Victoria Harbor, whether it's Elmvale, we need that integration between community and, and the hospital. So that's, I think, my, my biggest message here today is that, that linkage between our smaller municipalities, our smaller smaller communities, and, and the hospitals. And um, uh, next slide, please. Looking back a year ago, our biggest challenge at that time was adequately staffing the emergency department, having full physician coverage, keeping the doors open 24-7. Um, a year ago, last winter, we were we were at a really tough point. We had to downsize our staffing roster. We just didn't quite have enough physicians to cover at the shifts we wanted to. Um, fortunately, with some targeted um, recruitment, we have had a fair deal of success over the last 12 months. And I'm happy to report for the first time going forward, we have a, a full schedule, fully staffed physicians for our emergency department uh, into the spring and into the summer. So we have had a su successful year for the emergency department. Um, next slide, please. Our challenges this year, and Dr. Murdoch really, I think, summed this up quite well, is primary care, is family medicine, finding family physicians to, to work in our communities. Um, um, similar statistics to, to what he presented, there are many, many, many Canadians that don't have a family doctor, and that uh, that supply of new family doctors continues to, to decline. Um, as Stu said, fewer and fewer medical school graduates are choosing family medicine as as a discipline. So that makes our job recruiting, especially to smaller communities, even more challenging. Um, next slide, please. The other concerning challenge we have is, is the age of our, our, our physicians. Um, I think the, the red bars on this graph really illustrate the the need for us to be on top of this to really work on succession planning um, in the immediate future. We have locally a fair sized cohort of, of patients that are cared for by patient by physicians that are that are above 60, 65 years of age. Um, and that last bar on the right, I think, is the most most pressing one, obviously. Um, we've really shifted our recruitment and retention strategies to focus on what we call comprehensive family physicians that provide services both within the community in family doctor's offices and within the hospital. Um, next slide, please. Um, this one, just a quick slide, just sort of illustrating the, the, the startup costs for, for, a, new, for a new graduate. Um, um, medical school is expensive. Having a degree or two beforehand is, is costly, and then setting up an office-based practice in the community is, is quite costly as well. Um, next slide, please. Our, our new strategy. Um, so again, working together with the hospital, supporting primary care, family medicine in the communities is, is our big focus. And uh, next slide, please. Four main pillars for our for our for our strategy: rebranding, revitalizing, um, new social media um, representation, new websites, really reaching out to our, our new young physicians in the way that the, that they um, reply the best. And we've had many many successful candidates come through Instagram, come through LinkedIn come through our, our website. Um, we found this much, much more successful than uh, traditional styles of, of advertising in print media and things. So rebranding, revitalizing has been successful. Um, our partnership with the hospital, with GBGH, has been fantastic. We've shifted our um, support, uh, financial support uh, to the GBGH Foundation. Um, so they're, they're taking care of all, all of our funds um, and helping us with that. Um, 
integration as well, integrating with, with community members, with community organizations, getting the physicians that we're touring around um, welcomed into the community um, with, with tours, with uh, weekend stays to experience uh, North Simcoe um, to its fullest. And uh, again, as Dr. Murdoch mentioned, uh, education is I think arguably our most important uh, recruitment strategy. Um, we, we train medical residents in family medicine, we train medical students from University of Toronto, from McMaster, from uh, the Northern School, from Nausum, and uh, many international graduates um, uh, are, are looking to us for, for medical for placements and training as well. So education is a key pillar for us as well. Uh, next slide, please. Some successes, 2022-2023, um, happy to report four new family physicians that have joined our communities. Um, many of these have joined established practices. We've really worked on succession planning, making sure patients aren't left orphaned when their physicians retire. Um, all of these physicians are working uh, in the community, and three out of four also have an active role in the hospital as well. So I'm quite quite proud of that uh, uh, work that we accomplished last year. Uh, next slide, please. Going forward, um, we're uh, finalizing, as I said, uh, fully staffing our emergency department at, uh, at GBGH. Uh, we have uh, five new physicians that will be joining our team over the next uh, several months. Um, interestingly, the first physician uh, is a graduate from, um, from Iran and uh, established physician, previously the chief in a trauma hospital there, reached out to us through social media and wanted to move to Canada. Um, we made it happen with uh, with the hospital support, with our recruiter support. Um, navigating the the college, the licensing process was honestly quite challenging. Um, but he's here, he's living here, and uh, I think it's quite likely that he'll that he'll make uh, GBJH his his home hospital. Um, next slide, please. Uh, going forward, um, three main focuses for us um, besides our family medicine would be internal medicine. A hospitalist is a physician that works in the hospital caring for those patients that are admitted, um, and then obstetrics and gynecologists as well. So that's our, our main direction and goal going forward. Um, I think there's one more slide. Yeah, and uh, to cancel our request is for $4,000 to continue to support primarily community visits and, and relocation is what we uh, primarily use our uh, municipal contributions for. So um, thank you. I think there's one more slide. Perfect, yes. Yeah, so, uh, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to be respectful of your time and not uh, duplicate too much of what uh, we heard from our previous uh, presentation. I appreciate that. That was That was actually very informative and, and the story about someone looking up on social media and making their way over here. That's pretty incredible. So it really, yeah. times are changing. So yeah. uh, council may I have a mover and seconder to receive the presentation. And I have councillors Garwood and Deputy Mayor Cabral that the presentation from the South Georgian Bay Physician Recruitment regarding the 2023 budget request be received and that the 2023 South Georgian Bay Physician Recruitment budget request in the amount of $4,000 be referred to the January 20th, 2023 budget session for further consideration. Council, do we have any comment or questions at this time? And I will go to Councillor Moore. Thank you, Mayor Coughlin. I expected you to say all those in favor. I was ahead of you. <laughs> I don't have a question. Thank you for the presentation. That was really interesting. <laughs> she was just saying hi. Hello. I do, I do have comment from uh, Deputy Mayor Cabral, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor Call, and thank you, uh, Dr. Gleski. I just actually wanted to ask you a question with respect to the... Uh, a lot of the services that had been provided uh, over the last few years, especially mm -hmm. during the pandemic, where uh, doctors were able to, uh, like, remotely mm -hmm. uh, visit mm -hmm. with patients. And there were a lot of companies that were starting to offer that service. And I think mm -hmm. there was a, a change in the fee structure. Um, do you see that as something that will uh, possibly bring more doctors back into the community or, or, or totally the opposite? Interesting question, right? I completely agree. During the, the pandemic, uh, virtual care was, uh, I think, a, a 
priority for the uh, Ministry of Health and uh, the funding for that. Um, agree correctly that that fee structure has changed recently, but it still does apply to family physicians doing virtual care for their own roster of patients. Um, so it's still an option. Um, and, and that being said, we're, we're trying with our recruitment strategy to find, to find that balance. We have an ex a couple of physicians uh, that actually work in penetanguishing that uh, do most of their work virtually. Their, their home base is in the GTA and they're on site in our communities one or two days a week, uh, but still have that responsibility for a, a roster of local patients, uh, but are providing some care virtually and some care care um, remotely. So I, I think that's a new strategy that could work well for communities for which we're, we're having difficulties finding someone who wants to live full time there. And I'm meeting uh, next week with uh, one of our young colleagues that wants to sort of spearhead this and then see if there are more physicians that will work like him in that kind of mixed virtual uh, in-person way. Uh, but in, at the same time, taking responsibility for a, a group of patients in a community. So yeah, I think there's some potential there for sure. Thank you. And not seeing any other questions or comments, all in favor? And that has carried. Thank you again for being here with us. Thank you. Moving on, Council, may I have a mover and seconder for the confirmation bylaw? Councillors Garwood and Moore. That bylaw 2023-003 to confirm and adopt the proceedings of council at the special meeting held on January 18th, 2023, listed here and be signed and sealed by the mayor and clerk. All those in favor? And that has carried. And may I have a mover and seconder for the adjournment, please? Councillors Fisher and Alexander, that the special meeting of the Township of Springwater does here now adjourn at 4.34 p.m. to meet again in regular session on January 18th at 6.30 p.m. All those in favor? And that has carried.